Well, hello, everybody. This is Tim Green with Rattle Magazine. Welcome to Rattlecast number 230. Thanks so much for joining me a little bit early, uh, a couple hours before we usually do it, but I'm so glad you could make it. we got a good crew uh, watching already, so that sounds good. Uh, before we get to say that Rattle is a publication of the Rattle Foundation, a 501c3 nonprofit working to promote the practice of poetry. We've been in continuous publication since 1995 and are unaffiliated with any other organization. We just do this. We love poetry and know we do too. So please do click the like button and share, subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, leave reviews on iTunes, Spotify, uh, wherever you're listening to this later. Um, anything you do to help spread poetry on the internet is much appreciated. Um, now, Remus Uzgaris is our guest coming up. But before we begin with that, uh, we like to start with our Poet Respond Poet. And we have a familiar face this week. Uh, everybody will recognize who we have here. Hey, Dick, how you doing? Hey, Tim. Uh, well, you're a familiar face also. But it's great, <laughs> great to be back on the front end of the Zoom line. Yeah, definitely. It's good to have you up front. And um, it's just a wonderful hyphen that you wrote this week based on, as you know, I love science stories. And so it's based on a, a reversal of science, um, <laughs> which maybe um, yeah, explain how this poem came to be. Um, well, the poem actually evolved from a series, a, hi, a haiku series or, or senru series that I wrote, eight, eight sort of love senru. Um, and I had set them aside earlier in the week. And then I read this article. And it's, it's hard to call it science. It was a meta study mm -hmm. that only meta studied about four other studies. So, um, but it, it uh, was... Um, in theory, uh, debunking um, the love languages. Uh, the I, th I forget what the guy's name, pa I have it written somewhere, but the pastor who wrote the book in 1992, Gary Chapman, I think his name was, and a lot of people sort of glommed onto this and, and not for, you know, it, it, there's some interesting stuff in it. But anyway, I read the study and I started talking to Debbie about it and well, poems happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the, the idea of love languages, do you remember, isn't there five love languages? I think one is um, it's gifts, it's acts of service, it's like um, physical intimacy, maybe. Um, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, I, I th uh, had I read the book, which I admit in the poem I haven't, I would know. But uh, Yes, I, I think it. And, and the, one of the things the, stu the meta study said is, is there are a lot of people who think there are love languages, but this, these five are arbitrary mm -hmm. uh, and that there are, you know, some people believe there are many more and others um, uh, think there are three and people think they're either dispositive when it comes to predicting relationship stability or they're not or the opposite is. So, um you know, one guy wrote a very popular book that I think spoke as, I'm not sure, but my guess is it spoke more to women than it did to men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think it's, it seems to me just um, that the people who um, read that book end up thinking their love language is, is gifts and acts of service, because that's the way you get stuff, <laughs> which is kind of beneficial. Um, but it's interesting, though, because... Um, there's so much with uh, psychometric analysis now, which when I was uh, taking psychology classes like 20 years ago in college, everybody sort of poo-pooed and joked about psychometric stuff. Um, you know, the Myers-Briggs was all sort of a butt end, one chapter nobody paid much attention to. And then we got the big data going. And now the, the big five personality traits are such something that is actually taken seriously and pretty strong empirically. So maybe we could do some actual research on actual love languages now that the, um, the hypotheses phase is, is, is through. Um, anyway, yeah, it's a really interesting topic. Well, as, uh, my, my, uh, poem, my ekphrastic challenge poem about what the astrologer, uh, didn't get right. You know, relationships are long if you're lucky mm -hmm. and whatever, and people change, not only do people change, but they change in their relationship to things that might have driven them crazy before and no longer do. That's the hope. Mm -hmm. uh, in the long term. Yeah, I mean, maybe uh, more than love languages, it's the ability to adapt to someone else's languages in, in general. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's hear this poem, Dick. It's a really okay. wonderful hymen. I love the haiku, which, uh, as I, people have heard, I, I read the haiku first when I get hymen submissions, and they were great haiku. So uh, make for a really good hymen. Oh, thanks. And, and one other thing about it, the, the most inquiries I've had about it are, what is this form that you're doing? Is this a form? This is new to most, you know, here on the on these lines, people are familiar with them, mm -hmm. but it's not a well known well known form. 
So here we go. A Skeptic's Guide to Relationship Science. Deb and I lay in bed last night, skin to skin. I think my hand was on her thigh and hers caressed my chin, maybe thumbed my earlobe like she sometimes does. We talked again about love languages, how she likes to give little treasures and wants me to be more attentive to her lists. Like today, her cell phone won't sync. She needs help with it. She reminds me I still haven't hung Jeff's picture in the rest rec room. I know Deb's notebook is full of to-dos for me, all dated, some starred in red pen. There are too few checked off. I tap my fingertips, one by one, feather light on the small of her back. She sighs. I love her touch, typing. Today, I read to Deb from a new study. Love languages, it says, are not supported by empirical data. One of my love languages must be empirical data. She tells me about a conversation she had with our friend Claire. They were walking along Barton Pond in Ann Arbor. Deb recalls wearing new blue walking shoes, the ones she now dons to work in the garden. It must have been 30 years ago, she says. Claire's man Paul hadn't read the Love Languages book either. Growing old, we remember different things. I always wake later than Deb. This morning, I find a note taped to my computer keyboard. Kitchen counter, it read, written in aquamarine script. I'd left the remains of my dinner fixings, and now they stuck like glue to the old form mica. We often prepare and eat different meals, mine always with brown rice and beans and cooked greens, Deb's according to her mood. On the table where I sit to eat, there's a note rubber banded to the tamari bottle. Please return me to the shelf, it reads in bold black marker. As I clean the counter, Deb squeezes by. Her bottom brushes mine comfortably, for sure. Our kitchen, too small to miss her. Yeah. <clears throat> Excellent, Hyben. Thanks so much for sharing that, Dick, and for, for being here on the early side of the show. Really appreciate it. Uh, pre I appreciate it. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. Yep. yep, take care. That was a Dick Westheimer, you know, with a skeptic's guide to relationship science. And now we're going to take a quick break and go to our main guest, Remus Uzgaris. So sit tight and I'll be right back with more poetry. And we're back. Like I said, today's guest is Remus Uzgaris, 
uh, a poet, translator, and critic. He's the author of North of Paradise, published by Kelsey Books. Tarp, a collection of his poetry in Lithuanian translation, was published by Kuwako Laptai. He's the translator of a number of uh, books and has contributed significantly as editor and translator to two anthologies, How the Earth Carries Us, New Lithuanian Poets, and New Baltic Poets. He holds a PhD in philosophy from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and an MFA in creative writing from Rutgers Newark New University. He teaches translation at Vilnius University in Lithuania. And here he is, uh, Remus Uzgaris. Hey, Remus, how you doing? Hello, Tim. Thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure yeah. to be here. Yeah, it's so great to have you. It's really fun having, you know, poets from across the pond and all, all around the world. And it's uh, really fun to have you here. Do you want to start out with a poem? Sure thing. Uh, this poem is set in Konas, Lithuania from 1993. That is, it's me remembering <clears throat> my time there. In transit, the trolley bus won't go. Its reins have fallen from society's hands. When the driver lifts them up, a bolt of light breaks free, and we sink into silence again. I have to go. The flowers are wilting, and I have to go. This can't be, my love, our rusted hope, stalled on an outer road, stuck in a traffic ring while cars budge past, elbowing us. Like the scowling crone in a cowl, pushing through an oblivious crowd, a sewing pin stuck between fingers, needling the corpse of our post-Soviet, post-modern transport. This must be why, in Chagall's paintings, the lovers always fly. And that was uh, In Transit by Remus Uzgaris. Um, and so, so Remus, how did you, uh, to start out, like, how did you end up in Lithuania? Um, I wasn't sure if you were born there or not until, you know, reading your bio just recently. Um, but, you know, moved, for, you know, went through programs in the United States and then ended up in Lithuania. How did that come to be? Well, yeah, it's, it's what I write a lot about, actually, because it's an interesting question for me as well. Uh, I was born in the States, uh, but my parents were born here. Uh, they were uh, children when they came over right after the Second World War. So they were, as we call them, DPs, displaced persons. Now they just call them refugees. Uh, and so I'm I'm the son of refugees, you could say. Um, and uh, uh, why did I come back? <laughs> I, I kept coming back. And, uh, and uh, I kept finding, uh, this is my second wife here I have now, and I've made a family. And uh, I, I was never especially, I would say, patriotic or nationalistic or anything, uh, but something just kept pulling me back. Uh, I felt uh, somehow at home here, even though I grew up in a totally different uh, culture and society, right, in the United States. And, uh, and, and yet here I am. Uh, and trying to figure that out is is why I write a lot of the poems I do. <laughs> yeah, was it? Um, were you drawn to Lithuanian literature? Is that something? I mean, how did the genesis of becoming a poet start? You know, if if you were uh, you know, here in the United States, and then uh, what were the first poets you read? How did you fall in love with poetry? Oh, it was it was definitely English poetry. Um, and uh, it was probably I, I was a big comic book reader. This is in the late 80s. And, uh, and I found some comic books that actually had poetry or something like poetry. Uh, maybe now I would look differently at it. But at the time, I, I remember being amazed at uh, the power of language. And, uh, and I, I was also a big sci-fi fantasy reader. And I just got really entranced with language and expressing myself. And, and I would do it uh, little by little. And uh, it was always a kind of hobby until I realized, uh, I, I like to compare myself with Gauguin. <laughs> he gives me hope, I guess. Uh, you know, Gauguin was a Sunday painter until he finally decided I'm going all in with painting. And, and at a certain point, that's what happened to me. I was a kind of a Sunday poet and, uh, and decided to go all in. And, uh, and I realized that's, that's what my love was. That's what I wanted. Was there a certain? Uh, but it was uh, English poetry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was there a certain poem that that you wrote or read that made you 
I don't, for me, it was difficult to have um, permission to take poetry seriously as, as some kind of pursuit. Yeah. You know, I, I thought I'd, I'd be a, a scientist of some kind my whole childhood growing up. And, and then through a few years in college, and then finally, like a sort of like a process of giving in. And there were certain poems that I wrote myself that surprised myself and others that I read that made me feel like um, that this was something worth pursuing, you know, that's sort of neglected. And, and so there was like a permission aspect to it. Was there something like that for you? Like, how did you go from that Sunday poet to uh, being able to, you know, say, you know, I'm going to pursue this as the thing that I do with my life? It, it, it took a while for me. Um... But, you know, I, my father is, was also a physicist, and my mother was a science teacher, so I was raised in a very analytic scientific household, and, and yes, I didn't feel like poetry, I could really do it. Um, but, you know, Lithuania played a role, especially my time in 1993 when I was a young man there, uh, because I felt that uh, the arts and poetry were taken very seriously. And, and certainly in the late Soviet period in the 90s, poetry had a huge audience in Lithuania. And so that was an immediate contrast with what I felt in America. Yeah. And uh, of course, you know, America's booming with MFA programs now and so on. But, but there was a feeling in the culture in general that this is serious and important. And, and I think that slowly sunk into me, right? Yeah. So it wasn't so much any piece of Lithuanian literature uh, but maybe the general perspective in Lithuania on, on poetry and the arts that made me slowly realize, you know, why not do that, um, that this is OK and I can do it. Um, and my father actually had been a painter. I mean, he was he is an amateur painter. Uh, and, and he had once told me uh, I had always wanted to be a painter, but I, I was what did he say? It was something like I was scared, right, that I couldn't really make it, you know, and, and so he became a scientist instead. And, and at a certain point, I said, you know, I'm not going to be scared <laughs> um, whether I make it or not, whatever that means. Right. I'm I'm going to do it. So a number of factors, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, we all get to decide what we do with our wild <laughs> lives. <laughs> You know, we only get one. Yeah. You might as well do something that you, you only get one. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Well, let's hear another poem. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you want to do haymaking next? Sure. Sure. That's, that's a longer one. Uh, it also tells a story uh, from my time in Lithuania. Uh, and this was a trip uh, to uh, the western part of Lithuania to the countryside where I really experienced the country life and in some ways a, a very... Uh, so-called primitive country life. I mean, it's gone now. People don't don't pull hay with uh, horse-drawn carriages anymore. But this was still happening uh, for some people anyway. And I, I sort of experienced the prototypical Lithuanian national activity of farming a little bit, right? And being out in the farm. Haymaking. The farmstead was tucked away like a child in sheets of gently rolling Samogitian land. Tufts of deciduous trees, the occasional stand of pine, long stretches of rape and rye rounded by the odd dairy cow fertilizing the ground. The man of the house watched TV, paralyzed. Three women worked the fields. They took me to harvest hay. We rode a cart pulled by a hag. I was given a two-pronged fork, my trident to rule the waves, and struggled to correctly lift and tuck the golden threads onto the wooden loom. That morning, I had milked my first cow, trying not to show fear at the feet of the abrupt heft of the mammal, my senses overwhelmed by the sense of her muscle-rippled hide, by the dew-drenched grasses scumbled with the wild flowers of exclamation, whose names I didn't know, by the hot white manna squirting into a dented metal pail that peeled like a broken bell. The girls, as stout as the storks patrolling the fields, as focused and as at home, though they too would migrate to college over the horizon's edge, smiled at me as at an omen of the good life to come, while they worked the harvest into shape, sculpting their load, invisibly adept. I was the plump anthropological specimen, not they, visiting from far away, from a life they only saw refracted through a screen. My God, were they strong. 
I was to be a drenched rag doll pulled out of the sea in the still cool morning by the time we had loaded up, riding back on top of the pile of hay, feeling like a Bruegel subject completely out of place, as if I had been sucked into the frame straight from some cozy gallery couch. The tufts of trees, they explained, were graves of farmsteads from before the last war, neighbors dispossessed of their land and transported in cattle cars to make what they could of love and death in a new world of Siberian wastes. The mother had taken the fresh milk each day to the communist collective in the valley below. The land was theirs now, but she had to sell what they made, milk, salt, pork, eggs, and fowl, her husband making the best of it in his wheelchair. Bailing the hay from our creaky ship into its hollow, sun-slatted harbor, learning how to take that devil's fork up and up and up until the loft was covered in rough strands of gold. I had had enough of anthropology by then, and retired to a sunny mound to read Machernis's poems about these parts, the young poet himself blown up in a cart like the one I rode, fleeing the oncoming red tide, trying to find the mysterious ferry to the new world where my parents fled, finding Charon smiling instead, though no one knows which side lobbed the shell onto his family's desperate ride. The three came in after several more rounds of hay had been safely stowed away, thunderclouds gathered behind them like the omens of history. They thanked me for the unexpected help. I wanted to slink away to the city and never come back. They meant it. I would swear they were genuinely full of gratitude that not a single smile was snide or false or slow. I had a wife already, so this was not for show. I walked down to their little pond at night, undressed and took a swim. Duckweed parted, mosquitoes patrolled the sky above, stars poked like pinholes through shadows of intermittent clouds. It was calm, small, and beautiful, and meant nothing on its own. The city called, but I took the old phone off its hook and drifted. I drifted away. I drifted here. Yeah, that's Remus Usgaris with Haymaking. That's from Rattle's uh, fall issue. Um, and it, it's interesting, uh, you know, reading through your books this week and, and, and hearing your life story, how similar it is to uh, Michael Favala Goldman, who we um, interviewed with our um, uh, translation issue in the fall of 2022. And um, he went back, um, you know, he's a Danish translator, and went back and sort of fell in love too well on a farm and and sort of you know ended mm. up going back and forth and translating so many danish poets too um and a similar sort of size countries and similar ways of life maybe what do you think was it that, that drew you back there in 1993 was it sort of the I, I can imagine you know family stories and sort of being a curiosity that develops as you um as you think about your roots was that what drew you back or, or what was that invisible force that got you there? It was something about that for sure. Uh, uh, I suppose superficially I was an anthropology major and I had decided I'm going to study Lithuania, right, for grad school. And and I, ha I took a year off, a gap year, and I, I, I went to Lithuania to see what it's all about, to relearn the language or learn it better because mine wasn't very good at the time. Um, and, uh, and you keep getting back to that question of what really drew me back. And, and it's, it is hard to say. I sometimes think the, the fact that my mother spoke the language to me first as a baby somehow is in my head. Uh, maybe my name is strange, right? I mean, I, I have a lot of Lithuanian American friends who who can anglicize their names very easily. Uh, my brother Polius becomes Paul. My friend Dinius becomes Danny, and so on. And in me, what can I? <laughs> There's nothing, you know. And and so I feel like I always felt like there was something connecting me to somewhere else. Like I didn't fully belong in America, and. Uh, it's something deep down uh, that I'm not sure exactly what it is that made me feel I have to figure out what, what was there. I mean, certainly I heard stories. and uh, My grandfather mostly told me war stories because he, he was recruited 
uh, after he ran away from Lithuania, he was going to be deport deported to Siberia for sure. He knew he was told, tipped off, and, uh, and he ran into Germany and they recruited him. And he had to fight for the Germans against the Soviets and his brother-in-law was on the Soviet side recruited. And so he, told, he used to tell me all kinds of stories about running and escaping and how they got out and how he reunited with his family. So I suppose there was a sense of uh, mystery and enchantment, you know, with what is this place that has such a strange history, you know? Um, yeah. And I, I uh, too, there, was there um, sort of an energy um, at the time, you know, given the fall of the Soviet Union? I think Lithuania, right, was the first country to leave the Soviet Union. And um, was there yes, sort of a, a, yes. an energy? I mean, and now... You know, it's it's one of the strongest democracies as far as like you know voting and things like that. Um, w was there a sense of a sort of energy and something going on there that you felt? Well, certainly, it. I mean, it opened up. I, I had gone before in the Soviet Union period. Uh, you know, for a ten day trip when I was fifteen with my mother and grandmother. But uh, but certainly when when things opened up and it was an independent country, there was a curiosity, you know, uh, a lot of Lithuanian Americans in my generation also felt that you know, a lot of them went back to see, you know, what's going on? What can we do? Can we help? Um, and uh, and so there's no question we, you know, we were sort of raised uh, in the sense of, you know, Lithuania needs to be safeguarded, protected, and saved, right? Um, and, uh, and suddenly it was there again on the map. And, uh, and, and a lot of us wanted to go and see, you know, mm -hmm. what this place really was. Yeah, it's interesting, too, how, how quickly, you know, those Eastern European countries have progressed. I remember reading a po or a, a article about how um, the Internet in Estonia it, like, is the best Internet in, like, the entire world. Um, and, and, uh, in Lithuania too, I mean, it's one of the highest, um, you know, median incomes and things like that. Um, and, and you mentioned that the times of haymaking like that in your, in the poem you read sort of being gone already, that was only, you know, 30 years ago. Um, I'm curious how, um, you know, that love of poetry that you talked about has hung around in the face of all that development. Is poetry now as popular there in Lithuania as it was in 1993? No, no, mm -hmm. it's not. Um, it's uh, it's more like, I suppose, the West now, right? I mean, it's it's more like Britain, America, or whatnot. Uh, maybe not Ireland because they're they're pretty good at the poetry, but uh, you know, it's it's become more normal. Uh, what happened in the late Soviet period was that poetry became a a, a repository and expression of identity. Of, of who Lithuanians were, right? Uh, we're not just Soviet citizens. We're, we're different, we're our own people uh, with our own language and uh, it became extremely important uh, to people, mm -hmm. uh, especially because it could speak in metaphors and so on. It, it, it could say things to them that they would understand that the censors wouldn't, right? And, and so there was a kind of, it was, it's been called an Esopian language that developed where people could feel the meaning and the censors wouldn't get it. And so it, it, it was very, very important. And, and it's in a way natural that it declined a bit. You know, people in the 90s, especially, they suddenly needed to make money and they wanted to make money. Mm -hmm. And uh, in poetry and the arts uh, went through their own kind of avant-garde explosion, right? There was, uh, you know, once the Soviet barriers were lifted, Everyone was doing whatever, right? It was postmodernism uh, let loose suddenly, and uh, a lot of experimentation. But the audience definitely declined. Mm -hmm. People were thinking about other things. <laughs> uh, but now it's sort of stable, right? It's got a steady audience and uh, lots of readings and so on. Yeah, I mean, it is interesting how you know all those market forces come into play um, with poetry itself, and uh, you know it's hard to compete for entertainment, you know, with other things. And, you know, it's, it, there's just a way that things sure. go. And, and I think, unfortunately, poetry <laughs> falls victim to that no matter where you are in the world. Um, yeah, so that's interesting, kind of a test case for that. Uh, but let's read the next poem, A Brief History of Vilnius. Okay. A Brief History of Vilnius. 
Nestled in a nest of forested hills far north of Mediterranean sun, squats a city that seems a reverie of Spanish or Italian Baroque. They say a duke once dreamed an iron wolf howling upon a hill. The pagan seer then said to him, you must build your castle there. What happened after that is harder to trace in lines, the blend of Balts and Poles, then Jews, of Russians, Belarusians too, and God knows how many more who came through, Germans and Swedes, the tattered rags of the Grand Automé, Soviets of many regards, and we can't leave out the Italian craftsmen who arrived at Bonasforce's bequest to remake Krakow and Vilno as well. And so, Medieval was reborn as late Baroque. Now you can tell the Russian Empire facades by their mustard yellow bricks tinged with soot. You can tell the Soviet Empire buildings by their concrete slabs like winter skies, middle-aged men who haven't aged well, perhaps like most systems of thought imposed on our primordial woods. Though I like some Catholic places best, over 2,000 figures in white granite adorning the church of Peter and Paul, or the Grand Duke's crown on St. Casimir's head. Some say a basilic, basilisk dwells below ground. He crawls through tunnels and sewers, art circles of hell. He eats what is left behind. I try to remember, to keep it all in the light. Yet my memories always lead to other lands, like the Lithuanians who moved here after the war to settle where Poles and Jews once lived, while thinking inveterately of their farms. I seem to live in a present of never knowing, always surprised at how a narrow street snakes, meeting a statue that I swear wasn't there before, that says you are always somewhere, someone else. Yeah, that's a great poem. That was... Uh... Uh, a brief history of Vilnius. Um, and so I, I assume that you're, you know, fluent in, in the Lithuanian language, right? Yes. Um, how much does that influence your poetry? Um, your, you know, your poetry in English. Uh, people have already mentioned um, the, the sounds and the, the alliteration that you use in the poems. There's a, there's a sort of a alliterative quality to it. Um, how much, I don't know, how much influence does, does the two languages come into play? Uh, it's very hard for me to say. Uh, I I would say that it's probably not that much. Um, maybe certain Lithuanian poetry has started to influence me more. Uh, it, it's hard for me to see from the outside, you know. Uh, I've, of course, always loved the sound of language. That's one of the reasons I fell in love with poetry. And it was English poetry. And, and so sound has always been important to me. It's why I've learned how to write rhyming poems as well and to rhyme translations. Um, and, you know, I guess Lithuanians also love the sound of the language and, and they do write even to this day a lot of poems in form, right, that, that rhyme. Uh, there's plenty of free verse, of course, uh, but, but they still, you know, think it entirely natural to publish a book that has some free verse and some rhymes as well. Thomas Venslova recently uh, published a book like that that won a big award here. Uh, you know, he mixes, uh, he mixes different styles. Uh, but, but for people here, the rhyme is natural. And um, yeah, that's about as much as I can say, because otherwise it's very hard um, to know how the, the Lithuanian language is pretty deep from the very beginnings of my life. So it's hard for me to have perspective, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is a very different language from English, right? Isn't it one of the oldest languages oh, yes. that, that's still extant, right? I mean, I, th I think going back to... Uh, yeah, well, in terms of Indo-European, yeah, roots, it is uh, considered by linguists to have the most archaic forms, right, uh, connected to Sanskrit and so on. Um, so, so it's in that sense archaic, yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it's not an easy language. <laughs> it's not an easy language. Yeah, and, and, and in fact, I'm ter I'm bad at writing it. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not a good writer of Lithuanian. Oh, really? So, <clears> do you do you ever write poems in Lithuanian, or is it always English? You know, I tried when I was younger. Um, I I did, but uh, um, now you see what's happened is my service to the country is my English knowledge and skills. 
So I teach in English and I, I translate it to English. <laughs> and, I, and I talk to my kids in English because they're going to Lithuanian school. So I want that. So much of my life is still in English. And, and so I've never been forced to develop the writing skill. You know, I, I've got the literary vocabulary from lots of reading and, and listening. Um, but but the usage and I, and when I write it tends to be an English syntax, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, which is just not literary Lithuanian, you know. And, and I would need some time to just do nothing but that, mm -hmm. you know. Do and, you think you might? I, that would, you know, is there something you might do? I suppose it's possible. I suppose. I, I suppose if I feel uh, happy at some point and where I am with my English poetry and you know maybe maybe I would. Mm -hmm. Maybe we would to see what would happen. Maybe it would be interesting because, like I said, that that was my first language as a baby, right? And so d there's this feeling in me that maybe something could happen if I got back to it. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, well, the next poem up is uh, <clears throat> "North of Paradise," which is the title poem to your your uh, book. Um, can you explain to once you read that poem, but explain to why you chose that as the title poem to the book? Yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I wish it was so easy to explain, um, but I, I suppose it has to do a little bit with dislocation, although in this case it's about translation. Uh, the, the, the Marius I mentioned, Marius, uh, Marius is actually a, a poet friend I translated. That's the book I translated of his work. Um, and, and we did a lot of work together. Uh, he translates from English to Lithuanian, he translates me. Uh, so he's the primary translator of my Lithuanian book, Tarp, um, and, uh, and I translate him. And, and he's also works with me as an editor. He checks my translations and he's very, very good because he knows English and Lithuanian poetry very well. And so this is, a uh, you know, translation is about somewhat dislocating yourself, going into a different mindset and, and trying to figure out how it works in your language. And uh, and I think that the the whole book is partly about that sense of being dislocated, but trying to work through it and find the language to live in. I suppose, mm -hmm. let's say. Uh, here, well, here's the poem. <laughs> Excuse me. North of Paradise, the terrace lay empty as Eden under a prescient autumn cloud. No one risked the gift of rain or early darkness like a shroud. Marus and I tarried outside, smoking our camel grays, before ducking inside to hide from a sky so far away from what summer had sung to us all. We huddled then in a concrete den where people whispered as if to a wall. Sipping black coffee, we translated again, turning self into other, yours into mine, being reborn or not in every line. Yeah, and so it was North of Paradise, the title poem um, to Remus's uh, recent book from a few years ago. Um, so, so what is your um, your your opinion on translation? Uh, the stance you kind of take because there's this this whole continuum of how literal to be. You know, on the one end there, I always think of Eugenio Montale, who I love um, when translated by Charles Wright very loosely. And then uh, by William Arrowsmith, very uh, more precisely, it seems like it loses some of the music, um, but then it's more accurate at the same time. So, so what is your, your sense of where to position yourself as a translator? Because there's so many, you know, the, the music of languages is so different. Even the, the way languages are timed is different. Um, and then all the idioms are different. There's so much difference. Uh, how do you go about, do you, do you think more of capturing the spirit or more capturing the content when you're, when you're um, translating? Uh, well, I'm, I'm in a, a, a position where, first of all, I do, I translate mostly living authors. So there, there can be a problem there if you don't stick close to the content. Mm -hmm. uh, I've had people say, I didn't write that. <laughs> uh, you know, some people are, are understanding and they realize you're going for something. They let you change something. And, and others say, that's not what I wrote. You can't do that. Uh, so, 
you know, it, it's it's great when Borges writes about uh, translating Homer and all these versions of Homer and versions of uh, the Thousand and One Nights. But, you know, those those authors are dead and they might not have even had one author. Right. Uh, it's easy. Right. To, to say, be creative um, when there's an author looking over your shoulder. You know, it's a little harder. Uh, what, what I found when translating uh, Myronis recently, the, the great romantic bard of Lithuanian poetry, is it, music is really important to him. So I'm trying to capture the music. And yet there doesn't exist a book in English of his work. Mm -hmm. So I also have a responsibility for people to know what he's talking about, right? I, I, I don't want to change the metaphors. I don't want to change really the nitty bitty of what he's talking about, you know, his images, his historical references. I, I, ha I feel a responsibility um, as one of the only people doing it into English uh, to, to convey it. Uh, so it's a hard balance. I try to balance, you know, getting as much music and, and poetry as I can while, while staying true to what's being said. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like a big responsibility to be translating, you know, I think Myronis is um, considered like one of the great poets of Lithuania, right? I mean, maybe the preeminent yeah. poet. Um, and to be doing the first, you know, English translation of, a, of that major work, um, you know, must be a lot of responsibility. How did you come to uh, doing that project? Uh, it was easy. The Myronis Literature Museum in Konas uh, called me up and said, we want a book in English of Myronis. Can you do it? <laughs> and uh, and I said, yes. <laughs> um, I understand them. They're, they're a museum and they have foreign visitors and they go to foreign conferences and they can't show an English book. Right. Mm -hmm. he, he is in Polish. He's in Russian. He some other languages but you know most people need english and uh they don't have it right so they they don't know they can't share why they have a museum to the guy right so they need it uh and and i think lithuania needs it uh you know so it's i'm not the first translator of my but i'm the first one to do a book in english mm -hmm. right uh and uh so i think it's necessary can you so describe, uh, to, you know, his background yeah. and his place within the, the Lithuanian literary tradition? Well, he's uh, he, he's a Roman Catholic priest uh, in the late 19th century. Lithuanians, a lot of the educated Lithuanians came through the priesthood. Uh, it's it, this is very complicated historically. I try to talk about this in my introduction, but it's it's complicated because uh the cultural language in the 19th century was still Polish. That is, if you were upper class, well-educated, you spoke Polish. Um, you might be Lithuanian, whatever that meant exactly, but you spoke Polish. Uh, and so it, getting Lithuanians to write in Lithuanian um, as the democratic and nationalist movements started, well, who could do it, right? The peasants weren't writing poetry. They were singing folk songs. And so a lot of the priests were the, the clergymen were the first uh, really good poets. And uh, and he was the first uh, person to really expand the lyric possibilities of Lithuanian. We, we had had epic before him, uh, also clergymen, but uh, but he was the one who really showed what a lyric poem could be in Lithuanian, how it could sound, how the ballad could be used in literature in Lithuanian, much like Wordsworth and Coleridge, right, had done a hundred years earlier. Mm -hmm. So he, he's really canonical for that reason. Um, you know, he he is in a way late, right? He's a hundred years roughly after lyrical ballads, uh, but that's again for historical reasons, you know, mm -hmm. by, by the time someone could write in Lithuanian. Lithuanian was at the time when he started writing band in its alphabet, right? You couldn't write in, in Latin letters in the Russian Empire. Oh, really? I didn't know. Uh, so, so, yeah, the Tsar was kind of angry about the 1863 uprising, and uh, he banned it. Um, and so Maidonis published, Maidonis is a pen name, uh, and he published it under a pen name in, in Prussia, Hmm. Uh, where they had uh, Lithuanian publishing going on in German-speaking German Prussia. Yeah, well, very interesting. Let's hear uh, hear one of those poems, um, Trike Castle. 
Yeah, this is uh, one of his most famous ones. So it, of course, has historical references because uh, one thing I didn't mention was he was crucial in his lyricism for elevating Lithuanian consciousness of who they were as a people and helping establish it. Trakai Castle. With moss and mold overgrown, in Trakai a worthy castle stands. While its lord sleeps soundly in stone, the castle looks over the land. But as the years run by, the walls now groan, they dwindle each day, neglected alone. When wind comes troubling the water and the lake tries to climb onto shore, the waves wash up to the tower and it crumbles like never before. So the walls fall apart day by day, filling our hearts with dismay. O oh, glorious keep, is this really your fate? What heroes came forth through your gates? You saw the might of Vitotas the Great as he rode under history's weight. So where is your strength, your inheritance? Where are the days once dear gone hence? These silent walls, neglected by all, are now without guard and weaponry. How can we those dear times recall as they march down the road to eternity? O oh, dearest times, will they ever return? Or will we, as for youth, merely yearn? When I took the road through Trakai, my heart cried out in sharp pain. A tear washed my cheek on the sly, and my eyes couldn't take the strain. I felt my hopes for solace flee. Dark night was all that I could see. Yeah. <clears throat> and that was yeah. uh, Myronis, uh, Trakai Castle. Um, it, and here he is on my T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I even have a Myronis T-shirt, uh, and it has a line from that poem. <laughs> uh, so. Yeah, that, that's really really interesting. Um, what is a uh, was Myronis appreciated in his lifetime? Um, how does the history of, um, of 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 his place in you know the culture go? I mean, you have, he has a whole museum. Um, you know, what poet would you say he's like most similar to? What what Western American poet? And, um, and, and is, uh, I don't know, do, do all kids, school kids learn his poems? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes, yes. Everybody, everybody learns them. Um, there's of course parodies of this very famous poem because <laughs> not every kid, uh, you know, is appreciates having to memorize it. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so, uh, in, in they've made folk songs out of his poems and his poems are partly based on folk songs. And so there's this whole cycle where he's hooked into the, the folk tradition. And so he was very popular and still is, mm -hmm. he still is. And people still sing some of his songs. Some people don't even know it's his poem, right? They, they just know this song and they sing it on independence day or whatnot. And it's really his. Mm -hmm. And, um, so so he, he he was popular then and he uh he is still popular now uh i mean it took a little time because of course of the whole prohibitions and so on and under the russian empire but he lived to see independence mm -hmm. um and uh it's important to say of course that castle is rebuilt now you you can visit trakai castle it's very beautiful but when he visited it was it was in ruins right and and uh and that was his his great sadness there right? mm -hmm. Yeah, well, really he, he can be read as a as a colonial post-colonial poet mm -hmm. in other words right he's writing about occupation and and the repression of history and so on mm -hmm. yeah it's just really interesting to learn about all this which is all new to me until being introduced to your your work um but let, let's read another poem i had to say too if anybody has any questions for remus uh leave them in the chat windows either on facebook or youtube and i can pass anything on um Let's see. But the next poem up we had was Over and Out, another, another of your own poems, a recent one. Yes, yes, this is more recent. Um, uh, and, and it's based on uh, a reading at the Vilnius Book Fair uh, a year ago, well, a year minus three weeks. It's coming up again. And, uh, and it was actually on the anniversary of uh, Russia's second invasion of Ukraine. And we had a number of Ukrainian poets um, visiting, uh, they they come often. We invite them and translate them into Lithuanian and so on, and uh, support them as much as we can. Uh, and it was interesting. It's interesting, of course. They were all women, <laughs> and uh, and the poem, in a way, makes clear why. Over and out. 
Daddy, pick me up, after the Ukrainian reading in which Halina read, whose husband is in a bunker at the front, in which Katerina read poems by 20-something Anton written from a trench at the front. At that moment, the room was dense with all the air we breathe, an oxygenless vacuum, a soundless space. One of the translators barely made it through. His spacesuit must have been malfunctioning. And we had to go outside, where the TV tower loomed in a zero Kelvin night, where 14 souls had been sucked under Soviet tanks, automatic doors closing behind, the Lviv women standing there like an envoy of Aranyes. No, just young women standing, smoking, stunned. Daddy, pick me up, my daughter said, and I told them how glad I was they were here, how pleased we could host them, what an example Ukrainians set for poetry and courage. Oh, my spacesuit must have been malfunctioning. My daughter looped around my neck, my American smile so unlike their own, which looked as if they were pressing their lips hard to keep the air inside, only to realize there is no spaceship, but rockets, rockets burning bright in the cities of their night. Goodbye, goodbye, said my daughter and I, as we opened our parachute and gently drifted home. Yeah, great metaphor there. There's a recent poem from Remus Uzgaris, uh, Over and Out. Um, can you tell us uh, anything about your, your writing process? Um, you know, how do you confront the page when you're sitting down to write? And, and d does the, the fact that you translate so much affect that at all? Um, is, it, is it something, you know, what is your, your goal, I guess, is time to ask as you write uh, a poem? Um, well, because I do translate so much, uh, of course, that's one reason I often write about myself in my poems. You know, I thought, why don't I write more persona poems? And it's like, well, that's because that's what I'm doing all the time with translation. I'm always in someone else's head. Uh, and so there's times where I want to give myself space, right, and, and try to figure out my own life uh, through poetry. And, uh, and I think that's essentially what happens. Uh, I, I, you know, there's so much day in, day out working with translation that sometimes if I just give myself time, as one Lithuanian poet said, to write poems, you have to lay on the couch a lot. <laughs> and, if, and if I just give myself time to uh, just be, uh, I often find, uh, you know, have this needling feeling, right? This tingling, <laughs> I don't know what to call it exactly. It's some sense that there's something I need to get out. And that's when I sit down. Right to, to write my own poem. Um, I, I don't do it regularly because regularly I'm translating. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I try to let myself have moments, and and then some feeling starts coming, and 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 I try figuring out what it is that needs to be expressed. Um, it often, you know, st starts from something I experienced also. Mm -hmm. Or that is when I start writing about something I experienced, that feeling hooks in and hopefully I can get to something more. <laughs> right. Would you say, uh, you know, when something's trying to hook you in, would you say it's more the image uh, of what you see or is it the music of the, the line that, that pulls you forward? Mm -hmm. um, I, I think the first thing is, is always this uncertain feeling. Um, that something needs to be thought about express somehow and uh and then when uh, the first words start getting put down then in a way the form of the poem is usually taking shape uh, and the music will have something to do with it for sure but it also sort of depends on what that feeling is because sometimes i can be more traditional uh and write you know more in the style of i don't know seamus heaney or something and then sometimes there's, like in this poem, something colloquial, something jumping around uh, with my everyday tone of voice. Um, and it's hard for me to know when it's going to be one or the other. And, uh, and But I know I need both kinds of styles. I, I, need, to, I need both because I need to say things that are different somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, well, let's hear uh, mm -hmm. another one. Next up is uh, Reflections from Brussels. Mm -hmm. This is from uh, North of Paradise. Um, 
reflections from Brussels. I saw Jesus eating with a wooden spoon, a painting bringing him home to the peasants and petty bourgeoisie. I saw Jesus sleeping in his mother's arms, hunched over a little bit blue, as if he were about to vomit, like my son vomited in the car on the way to the MFA last month. My son who eats from a plastic spoon, my son in my arms, a little blue, now that I'm leaving for Brussels to read some poems with others against an always gathering gloom. We fly like angels on a cloud, carried inside welded metal plates full of dreams as light as hot air. Here are some pictures at an exhibition. Here are some pictures on a computer file. They all flit by, fading, depixelating, losing the shine of Michael Shield, Bruegel's angel casting demons into hell. I saw scales of fuming metal cars flee Brussels in the gathering night, demons or angels they might have been, all hoping to get home, to see their only son or daughter eating milk soup with a wooden spoon. Yeah, that's a great example of, um, of, the, of the music in your poetry. There's Reflections from Brussels by uh, Remus Usgaris. And I mean, all those spoon in, uh, in a blue gloom. And then it ends on those ooze yeah, sounds too. I can't help home it. Home even. <laughs> yeah, um, there's just a, a beautiful music there. And it feels to me like you can feel, you know, the music pulling the poetry through. Um, um, I, I'm curious about, um, you said something about, you know, finding a way to discover yourself or what you, what that feeling that itches, um, that, that thing that's sort of needling at you. I can't remember exactly how you described it, but there's that, that sense. I that, said both those things. Yeah. Did yeah. You? Okay. yeah. Um. And, and, <laughs> and so it's really interesting to me. It seems like that is like an inevitable part of the way, um, poetry develops, you know, cause we had so many uses and we were talking at, at the beginning with haymaking, um, you know, the way that poetry has a big place in society when it has all these reasons for being shared, you know, when we don't have easy ways to communicate, we have to sort of communicate in more subtle ways. Um, you know, we don't have as much entertainment, you know, and so, you know, and even going back even farther, when there's less literacy, it's so much easier to remember poetry. And then it is, all those things are sort of chipped away by technology. Sort of what remains is this, um, this exploration of the eye. And it feels like all poetry drifts in that direction. Even if you look at something like the Japanese haiku tradition, it moves in that way too. And um, do you do you feel any? Um, I don't, I'm just curious about having so many poets that you translate that that have done different things and having sort of a lot of cultural if, influence, which poetry doesn't have now. Do you think that's something that we should be trying to do? Uh, you know, and still having that kind of cultural significance, or do you think the turn inward? Um, is is just as important, and we should just keep doing that because that's what we've been doing with poetry, really. I think um, my feeling is it's very hard to get back to uh, a voice that speaks for the society. Um, I mean, just take American society, right? Who who can speak for all of it, right? All the different people. Uh, uh, you know, societies are so big now and and we're all in in ways fragmented, fractured, uh, segmented, different in various ways. It's it's hard to feel that to me. This is my opinion, of course, but it's hard to for anyone to feel that sense that I can speak for everyone. And it's happened in Lithuanian poetry, too, uh, by the way, uh, you know, during the late Soviet period. Poets were not writing about their personal lives. They were speaking for the society, right? And it was a kind of smaller, unified society then. And after independence, things started to drift their own directions. And suddenly poets are talking more about themselves and their own experience. And, uh, and there is this sense that, you know, societies just aren't that unified anymore. I mean, Eliot, T.S. Eliot bemoaned this back in the wasteland days, right? That the, the organic society has fallen apart. We don't have it anymore. And uh, I think it, that's largely right. Um, and, and we don't. And, and one way to deal with that is, is to go from your perspective, uh, the I, and hope that you can bring others along <laughs> in, in sharing. Um, of course, another perspective is, you know, Eliot's fragmentation or Ashbury's fragmentation, and and and, and then you, there's no I, but there's no we either, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So, so I, my feeling is that's just uh, sort of where we've gotten to in our modern societies. And uh, I don't think as a poet, I can do much to change that probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really interesting uh, to hear it put that way as far as, as the, the sort of the loss of the we. And it really makes a lot of sense too, especially, you know, with technology, everything's so individualized as well. Like we have our own sort of online experience surrounded by the people who agree with us and from the watch the news and, you know, entertainment and literary sources that we like. And you sort of end up being in these little bubbles all over the place. It's like this bubble world. And so it makes sense that, that poetry is fragmented too into these little sort of microcosms instead of being able to see the macrocosm is just too vast and complicated. Um, yeah, it's so a really interesting way to look at it. Um, going back to the writing process, um, it was Paul Mitchell Bernstein who asked about editing, and I was going to ask about that too. But do you edit as you go or after or both? Um, do you resist editing as you go? So, so what is your, your process like? I mean, we talk to poets all the time about their process. Some poets, um, you know, it's like a first thought, best thought. They kind of go, they don't finish a sentence until they like it, and then they move on to the next one. Some people revise and revise and revise. Uh, which, which camp are you, if either one? Uh, I'm I'm more in the revisers camp. Um, I I do once once that feeling comes I was talking about I, I'd like to sit down and get it out, you know, and I, I really like to get it all out, so to speak, as best I can, um, and uh, and then of course it's going back, right, going back and trying to fix it and uh, and and ask questions of it and. And that can take a long time. I mean, some poems like this one I uh, was was pretty quick. There wasn't a lot of revision, and thank God for that, that there's poems like that, because there's others that take me years. Like in transit, I opened with in transit. The basic poem was written pretty quickly, but the ending was off. I didn't have that ending with turning to Chagall. And I just kept rewriting the ending, rewriting, and then I think it's done, and I send it out, and it gets rejected, and I keep looking at it going, there's still something there, but I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. It took me like three years before that Chagall ending suddenly burst in, hmm. right? And then I knew, right? That finally, it's done. <laughs> finally. <laughs> So, so yeah, I'm, I'm more the revision and, and leaning towards Elizabeth Bishop <laughs> taking a long time. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so, so for, mm -hmm. for a poem like that, where, where it didn't have the right ending, you know, how do you go about finding that? Is it just a matter of rewriting the poem over and over again until you stumble upon the right, uh, the right way that it really wanted to be or, or, um, uh, how do you how do you find that when the poem you know you can put your you can always put your finger on what's not working I think it's it's kind of easy to do but then how yeah. to make that jump is something that's not so easy. Oh, I wish I knew, Tim. I, I wish I had a secret, uh, you know, that reveals uh, how it's done. Uh, like I said, it took a long time, and and I think sometimes it's uh, different life experiences, things you're reading. Suddenly, your mind is in a different place, and you read the ending. And something opens up and you realize. Um, but, you know, before then, it's very frustrating because I, I keep thinking I got it right. Mm -hmm. And then a, a month or two later, I'm like, I ah, not quite, <laughs> you know. And uh, so it's, it, it can be very frustrating when poems are like that. Mm -hmm. And I have a number that are like that. Luckily, some that aren't. But they just I keep thinking maybe I got it, you know. And then, no, it turns out I didn't. <laughs> yeah, how easily we deceive ourselves, I guess. Or one of the yeah. ways to, to solve that is to uh, you know do readings and sort of have to expose your poem to the actual world. And then you, want to, then you have to confront yes. the fact that it doesn't work. Are you able to do much of that um, in Lithuania in, in English poems? Well, is I it, mean, what is the, somebody asked great... earlier what the um, response is to your English poems in Lithuania. Do people there read them? They do. I mean, I, I've sold uh, copies of my book there, certainly. Uh, uh, actually, the ones I brought to the bookstores are, are sold out now. So uh, people do read the English. You know, the young people all know English. Mm -hmm. And uh, and they, when they know me or hear me, they, they often want to look at, at the English versions. Um, but I often, because I'm fluent in Lithuanian, you know, when my friend translates my poems he does a great job frankly he's a great translator uh i i often just read them in lithuanian mm -hmm. you know uh sort of out of respect to the audience right i and, and i'm a citizen right i live there and uh sometimes i'll read something in english 
but you're right, of course. That's why I appreciate being here, by the way. I really appreciate it because I, even when I do read in English, and I sometimes do, um, you know, I, my audience is not English as their first language, right? It's English as their second or third language. Mm -hmm. And so there's not quite the same sense of, to me, pressure, right, of... Of like when I when I go and read in front of you, for instance, right? an editor who's seen so much and and uh, it's it's different. It's different for sure. But I love reading in Lithuanian too, and and I love being part of the poetic community. And it's accepted me, and it's it's very you know in a way supportive and and, and positive. It's a good. It's a good literary community overall. Mm -hmm. right? Of course, people fight like everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> little animosities and so on but you know it's mm -hmm. i was just at a poetry reading today by the way <laughs> oh really before coming on yeah is, is there a yeah. um any kind of mm -hmm. pressure to write in different languages or pressure to keep it with the lithuanian i think it's a what they're two point a two and a half million maybe people um in lithuania yeah is, is there seven i guess yeah is, um yeah is there any are people writing in in other languages uh, to to reach a wider audience or is there is a sense that that poets should stay in lithuanian to preserve that heritage of the language i think um there are some people writing in english but they're not that good and uh one problem is they're not reading enough in english we'll see what happens but for the most part it's people are committed to the language they grew up in, right? And uh, it's a language where they fell in love with poetry, right? It's Lithuanian. And so they are writing in Lithuanian. Um, of course, the, we have ethnic Poles and ethnic Belarusians and, and ethnic Russians here too. And, and, and we've been lately uh, encouraging right, them to write. Um, uh, we have some Litvaks uh, as well, uh, that is Jewish Lithuanians, um, although no, nobody really knows yet much Yiddish anymore. Um, so, so we certainly encourage people whose language it is to write in it, because we, we, in a way, a lot of us are trying to resuscitate the idea of, of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, this multi-ethnic, multilingual place, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and we'd like it with, you know, more tolerance, right? And uh, so, so we encourage it, but, you know, for the most part, people are writing from the language they grew up in. And I think that's good. And I, I certainly don't want people to write in English uh, just to reach a wider audience. Heck, they have me. I can help <laughs> It can help them reach a wider audience. <laughs> yeah, very good point. Uh, well, let's see. We have two poems left. I think we can we can read them both. Let's do uh, let's do Lo Lo love in a foreign land right now. Okay. Yeah, this is uh, from my wife. Uh, actually, her artwork is on the cover of of these books. Um, so she's you know a, a superb artist, and I try to sometimes learn from her because I'm, as I said, from a scientific family, I'm very analytic, I studied analytic philosophy. Uh, I tend to be rational and classicist in how I approach a poem, and she is very intuitive, right? Um, an intuitive artist that uh, her intuition makes me jealous sometimes, right? I wish I, wish I could think that way, right? Love in a Foreign Land. Here they speak of ball lightning that enters through your window and electrifies you when you sleep. In my homeland, I never heard of this. There I slept alone and unperturbed in unavowed need of positive charge. A thousand shouting buds of May were but a picture on a wall until I opened this frame to you. Charged and charging, you flew through my relative space of longing to singe outdated Euclidean thoughts until I knew that lightning, like love, could float free of storm and thorn, ungrounded, anointing life, like the petals that fall on my cheek from the cracked and varnished canvas your brush has dabbed with electric light. Yeah, another great musical poem. Uh, that's... Uh... Love in a Foreign Land by Remus Usgaris. Um, we had a question going back to um, 
Let me find it. Lisa Seidenberg asks, going back to translation, she says, do you think you create mm -hmm. a new poem in translation? And it was sort of along the lines of what I was asking, but, but it makes, I, I like that. Um, and then Monica Dobo says, Lisa, that's a Zen question. And, and the combination <laughs> of those two comments just made me think about, we were talking about writing toward the self and sort of figuring yourself out. And the way to do that is to lose yourself. You know, you sort of find yourself by losing it. And that's what poetry mm -hmm. almost is. Um, do you find that same mm -hmm. process when you're translating? Like, is the, the ventriloquism of, of entering someone else's mind enough to, like, lose yourself and get that same experience where you're sort of surprised by what you're creating and what you're creating is some kind of new creative object? It's new for sure, and the original voice, of course, is not yours or doesn't originate with you. Um, yet there is you in it. Uh, certainly, this is from my experience. Uh, so it's not exactly Zen for me. Um, it's a great question, and my, my answer, I suppose, is to think of the translated poem, uh, not in terms of identity or disidentity exactly. It's, of course, a new poem. But I think, you know, Wittgenstein's idea of family resemblance is very relevant to translation because you're making a new poem, but damn, you want it to have a family resemblance to that original, mm -hmm. right? You want it to be recognizable as the son or daughter, let's say, of that other poem. And, uh, and if it's not, then you might have a problem, right? I mean, it might be an adaptation. It might be just a new creation. But, but as a translator, you want that family resemblance, right? So people say, aha, this is good as a poem in English, but I can see where it comes from, right? I, I, I can see the mommy or daddy, right? So, so that, that's how I think of it, um, that I'm coming together with the translate with the author and we're making this baby right? <laughs> all in our heads, right? Like Zeus, uh, the Athena out of Zeus, right? Um, it's all in our heads and, and we're trying to make something that's a little bit of both really, mm -hmm. you know? And, uh, yeah. Well, I like that, that concept of family resemblance. I think that works perfectly uh, for, for what I like with, you know, I, I want, you know, if I'm reading a translation, I want it to have life, even though it's, you know, not, not a literal translation. Um, and you know, it requires yeah. some, some space, I think, to, to, to translate over. Do, do you ever uh, translate from other languages besides Lithuanian? Or, or is it just that? Oh, I've, uh, I, you know, I've done some French because I, I studied French for a while. Um, I tried a little ancient Greek. <laughs> and, but let's face it, uh, you know, what I realized is there's a lot of people who know French and French literature better than I do, mm -hmm. right? And same with ancient Greek and Spanish and, you know, mm -hmm. any other language I've studied, there's plenty of people who can do it pretty much. Mm -hmm. uh, but with Lithuanian, I... I'm one of a few, right? There's a small handful of poetry translators mm -hmm. into English. And, and so I'm much more important here. And you, so that's why my focus is more mm -hmm. here. Do, yeah. do you think it's sort of okay to translate um, from a language that you're not fluent in? I mean, we've had guests before who translate, um, you know, all different languages. They don't actually speak. And they said that, you know, if you study and research enough, you can find, you know, what everything means and then piece it out and then turn it into English. And it's a great exercise um, and, and helps, too. Do, do you think that or do you think it should be a language in a culture that you know really well before you try to translate? I, you know, I'm not, I don't want to make a, a blanket statement. I mean, I, I think if you're going to do a lot of translation, knowing the culture and its literary history helps so much. Uh, just to figure out the tones of voice, right? That register. How, if you all of you know dictionary stuff, how do you know the tone of voice, right? This is a problem I have with actually Brodsky's translations of himself. I, I think his English tone of voice is off hmm. very often because I think he has a great dictionary knowledge of English. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, now, so if you don't if you don't know the culture and the and, and and how people speak and how they've written before, it's very hard to get the register right, you know, and and to pick up on on that voice in the right way. Uh, not to mention slang and all that stuff, right? And, and idioms mm -hmm. uh, and cultural references, right? Um, that dictionaries don't explain enough, right, or at all. So I, I think if you're going to do a lot of it, you, you really need to 
helps to delve more deeply into it. Mm -hmm. Of course, there can be poems here and there that you can do fine that way. Of mm -hmm. course, there can be, right? But, but in my case, it's, it's, you know, I've only improved by learning more about Lithuanian culture and history and la literature. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's helped me a lot, right? Yeah, well, that definitely makes sense. Um, let's close out. We're about out of time. Let's close out with the last poem you sent, uh, The Scene. Okay. Um, this is uh, based on a little painting my father did. Uh, and uh, as I was writing it, uh, Elizabeth Bishop's great poem called Poem <laughs> started getting into my head. And, uh, and so I borrowed a little bit at the end from her, right? So it's in a way it's dedicated to both my father uh, Egidius Eusgiris and Elizabeth Bishop. The scene. You can just make out a river, some spots of vermeer blue between twisted thin trunked trees, poplars, I think, Mohawk swamp inscribed on the reverse side. I know the place. If you don't pin me down, it's by the bike path along the former train track embankment. But why did he paint it? Did it call to mind the boggy homeland he left behind the Iron Curtain as a child? The iron jaws of the river's locks lie just downstream, doors like the gates of hell stopping the water, then swallowing pleasure boats whole, excreting them stunned and diminished to float past the scruff of shrubbery that grew like the beard of God on the balding island before the big drop over horizon's edge. We'll never go back there again to see this, feel this, Father. I am left to gaze through the slashes of thin-hipped poplars trembling between swift water and windy pine on the bluff behind. Just pools and runnels, dark clumps of damp earth, roots twisting over each other in search. God, it's a snake pit for a spot to hold on to, for a place to stand still. Though the painter has found it, the artificial embankment provides solid ground for a time to sit down, the banked artifice of our mortal trust. Yeah, and that was uh, the scene um, by Remus Uzgaris. Thanks so much for being a guest today. Remus, it's great talking to you and learning a lot and uh, really fascinating stuff. Thank you, Tim. It's a great pleasure. I'm it's so happy to share my poems in English, to talk to you in English, to an audience of poetry lovers. It's it's really a pleasure. Yeah, well, well we're definitely glad to have you here and, uh, and come back again sometime. Take care. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, that was Remus Uzgaris um, and uh, his book, uh, North of Paradise, you can find um, at the publisher's website, probably the best place to go. And that would be um, kelsaybooks.com. That's K-E-L-S-A-Y books.com. Just look up North of Paradise and you'll find that. Um, now we're going to take a quick break and go to our prompt lines. And how the prompt lines work, if you're new to this, um, I'm going to paste the uh, Zoom link into the chat windows on Facebook or YouTube. And then you uh, can join on Zoom and do this. So here is uh, the prompt for this week was to write a poem that tells a story about a silent interaction with a stranger. That was your prompt this week. If you have a poem that applies, um, email it to promptlines. That's promptlines, all one word, at rattle.com, promptlines at rattle.com. Then find the Zoom link that I'm about to share on uh, YouTube or Facebook. And, uh, but only join if you would like to share a poem. Um, otherwise, just sit tight right where you are, and that's the best place to watch and just enjoy the poetry is on the, on the original stream, either on Facebook or YouTube. But if you have something to share, jump over to the Zoom right now, and I'll be right back with more poetry.
And we're back. The prompt, once again, was to write a poem that tells a story about an inter silent interaction with a stranger. And our uh, prompt poems editor, Katie Dozier, is here. Hey, Katie, how are you doing today? Hey, great. I really enjoyed the show so far. Until I entered the fray. <laughs> <laughs> well, it only gets better when you're around, Katie. Aww. So, <laughs> so uh, what did you do uh, for the for the prompt this week? So I want to preface this by saying, like, when we put out the prompt, I never am like, oh, I'm actually going to twist the prompt and like not like I just, you know, I try to approach it as what I think would be a good thing for everybody to write and would be interesting and different, of course, than what we have been writing. Um, oh, hang on a second. Let me <laughs> mute. Hang on one second. There we go. There we go. Okay, we're better. <laughs> okay, so we're better. So um, I actually, it's interesting too that Dick Westheimer ended up having a PR poem this week that was a hyphen because I wrote a hyphen like a day before for the prom poem. And also I did something inspired by him because he found out that I always listen to like minimalist classical music when I write. And he was like, how can you do this? He was very surprised. So I decided that I wanted to write a poem that focused on sound. And I realized I shouldn't be listening to music when I did this. And now I kind of think maybe listening to music is dampening my ability to write sounds because it's that part of my brain's already like, checked off when i write so hmm. well that's really West interesting. influencing us all very much <laughs> this week. well he definitely always does even when he's not here he was here earlier and he's on the road right now so probably can't swing back in time but yeah westheimer does have influence and i uh i don't know i can't write i don't know i don't really know what i do with with music maybe i have music sometimes maybe i don't i don't know <laughs> i can't remember what i used to do like 20 years ago too did i have music on I'm not even sure. Well, <laughs> well, you're very accommodating to my weird music. I'll say that That's much. That's true. For you. I, I definitely don't mind. Um, so there's that. <laughs> well, let's hear your poem. This is delay. Yeah. Okay. Delay. The screech of the swing, the metal chains bolted to blue, the pause of the girl before she knows what to do. She digs her nails into the wet mulch. Another kid yells, "We!" just on time to soundtrack his plastic descent down a slide. The squeak of her sneakers climbing back up. Kids stomp and scream before they're forced to leave. Car door slam. Even the sun seems to speak. Her silent smile. Her little hands squeezing the monkey bars. Kicking her feet. Waiting to hear mama. A frozen drinking fountain. Yeah, I love that haiku at the end too. Uh, a hyben, and you can do, you know, we saw a hyben uh, that Dick Westheimer shared uh, at the beginning of the show but you can do hyphen uh, around anything and, uh, and a hyphen around a lineated poem like that works too so really interesting uh use of that um do you th the one thing i worry about with that is um is is not making it clear or not like knowing for a reader that that's what's going on like it seems <laughs> do, do you think that that is that something you worry about doing a poem like that it definitely doesn't happen when you read it out loud because you hear the sort of the pause but i wonder i wonder if that's ever an issue I don't know. I don't really feel like I feel like if it doesn't work without explaining what a hyphen is, then your poem is not actually successful. So maybe like I feel like it has to. And I mean, there's so much, you know, random line delineation and things like that that don't have a purpose. But I think even without knowing the hyphen form, you can look at something and understand that the haiku is like a really intense version that's heightening the meaning of the poem. Mm -hmm. Although reading a lot of hyphen does, does help, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. well, I think it, it probably does. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So it was a delay by Katie Dozier. And, uh, and so mine for this week was, um, you know, we, we, uh, I went to with my son and daughter, um, we went to one of the California missions, um, uh, because, you know, I think, I guess in every like California class, there's a project where you have to make like a, a model of one of the missions and they, and for extra credit points, you can go there. And so my son really wanted to do the San Diego mission, which is the oldest one. And he found, he tells me later that it's because it's the easiest one to build a model out of. So he's already like halfway there. Um, but so we went to the San Diego, uh, mission on Sunday. And this is just a little story of uh, what it was like to be there. Here we go. This poem is called Grace. The usher tried to usher us in with a graceful sweep of his gracious hand. He gestured toward an empty pew in a nearby row, as if the polished wood were waiting only for us. We didn't mean to disturb the service, which must have been a Catholic mass in the ancient mission now restored. 
We'd entered in a moment of silence and thought the silence empty, but here it was, full of the flesh, the priest was saying, as the parishioners lifted their heads and replied in unison in the language of the light that flickered from the candles that lined the little chapel's painted walls. I'm sorry, I moused to the usher, who bowed his graceful head. I'm sorry, I said, backing out the double doors and down the concrete steps and down the little hill, and only then, from the safety of the street, could we hear the choir's graceful song. There's Grace, mm -hmm. a little story from uh, the San Diego mission this weekend. Um, That's wonderful. Oh, thanks, Katie. Glad you like it. Yeah. I did um, like it. I was jealous I couldn't go, but now I feel like I was there. So that's good. <laughs> I know. Yeah. And then we went to the Torrey Pines too afterwards. Another nice fun place. The, the only, the home of the only Torrey Pines pine tree <laughs> in the world. So that was fun too, by the sea, by the ocean there. We had a nice trip. Wish you could have come. Um, but we will be together for uh, the prompt or for the uh, poet, poetry space. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> nice. So stuff. I got to like cycle through all the things we do. The poetry space this Thursday. What are we going to mm -hmm. talk about? <laughs> Uh, we are going to be talking about the hot topic at hand, uh, which is thanks in part to Julian Matthews, I think, messaging both of us and saying he suggested we should do an episode on it, which is going to be plagiarism. Uh, we want to look at not only the current plan plagiarism scandal in poetry, but also just plagiarism as a whole, including Michael Dylan Walsh's Deja Ku, which I just love any excuse to say. So... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think it will be fun on Thursdays at 3 Eastern. <laughs> over on x it's true it's thursdays <laughs> three o'clock eastern we'll be talking about that over on x or as a podcast all i have to do is list, list uh, the poetry space anywhere you get your podcast and that'll come up we talk about a topic for an hour a lot of people you see here uh, stop by there as well uh, you know dick westheimer uh, brian o'sullivan um, etc and uh, we have a lot of fun talking about a topic and the plagiarism thing you talk about is a pain in the butt i have to say i mean we always google you know, everything we publish, you know, we Google certain lines to make sure that it's not stolen from someone else. And it comes up sometimes. Um, but this is somebody who is just really prolific about uh, plagiarizing. And uh, and it makes me think maybe I should, you know, spring for some uh, some better plagiarism software or something, because I don't know if Google catches everything. If you're pulling stuff out of a print magazine, uh, Google's not going to find that. So maybe we have well, to start uh, working a little harder at the plagiarism. Maybe this guy's whole plan is just he's going to long con somebody into hiring him for plagiarism control. That's right. Shows how much maybe, he got you know, away he had some with stock it. in one of those companies that does plagiarism <laughs> software wants to have it be bought by Submittable <laughs> or something so they can check automatically. I don't know, but it's it's all over the place. Uh, but then there are also you know all the other topics of um, you know that anxiety of influence. Like a lot of people say they don't want to read too much because then they might write the same things. And there's the accidental plagiarism that happens all the time where you like don't label a note that you made and you think it's something you wrote but then really it's a line you liked from someone else that happens genuinely a lot um so just keeping track of notes and then the deja coup is a fascinating topic too because um you know I, now that i've lately the last couple of years i've been reading a lot more frog pond and modern haiku and you can look back at an issue from like 2005 and then you see a haiku that's kind of similar there's so few words that um you know things repeat <laughs> and so there'll be I, i've noticed one in like 2005 that was a uh, very similar to one in the current issue and, and not intentional it's just that deja coup that uh, michael dylan Walsh was talking about so a lot of things to talk about with uh with plagiarism we'll be doing that on thursday yeah i hope that you guys all come and we won't plagiarize what we just talked about for the oh. space it'll be new content well, that's another topic. can you plagiarize yourself that's another <laughs> <laughs> I don't know either. We'll find out. But anyway, thanks, Katie. And I know, you know, Charlotte is there and might be uh, awake and not nap time. So if she you can't is, come back, yeah. I don't blame you. It's okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. Take care. Yeah, it was Katie Dozier, our prompt poems editor, uh, with our two prompt poems this week. And let's go to uh, what everybody else has. Uh, but I expect, well, I thought it might be a shorter open lines given the different time, but we have uh, 16 people on the Zoom, including some new faces, which is great. Let's go to a familiar one first with Zachary Honeycutt ended up first in line this time. Hey, Zachary. Hey, Tim. How's it going? It's great. Good to see you. Yeah, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm so glad I'm not the only one in that boat because I OCD about that all the time, like reading when I read a bunch of poems that I admire and then I'm like getting inspired to write a new poem. I, yeah, I thought I was the only one. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm yeah, well, I mean, I, in one way, like everything under the sun has been thought of before. There's a great essay um, by my friend Eric Campbell, who's been a guest in the Rattlecast, the accidental plagiarist, 
that was viral at a Virginia Quarterly Review years ago about uh, about just that topic. And it is it is a sort of a stress that maybe we should get over because it just happens. I like that's why I like the deja vu concept. Maybe we should be a little <laughs> more gentle to accidents, uh, even as we punish those who uh, who you know, violate the rules on purpose. But, uh, but anyway, what do you have for us this week, Zach? Okay, so I uh, I took a trip off the beaten path, and uh, I wrote another villanelle for an epigraph poem about one of my favorite chapbooks, Adult Night at Skate World by Christina Callery. Oh, great. Yeah, I had a copy. If you remember, she was a guest uh, for the Halloween show, and I couldn't find my copy, so apparently you were the one who stole it. <laughs> <laughs> I plagiarized it. No. Yeah. Um, but uh, yes, yeah, so I'm going to read this. This, this, I think the best way to describe this villanelle is just that I tried to write something that would encapsulate the the overall mood that I felt after I read a bunch of her poems, which I really admire. I love a lot of her poems. I think my favorite one from this book is probably Harvest Moon on Trash Night. And I also love Miss Connections, which is where I got this quote. Adult Night at Skate World. Yet even you are no less lucky than all us dingbat romantics the world over. Our hearts electric with longing to touch the impossible, the way lightning rips its jagged course across the sky. And so I titled this A Villanelle for Christina. I could feel her presence in every word floating over me somewhere in between heaven. The ghost of a romantic, lingering unspurred, encapsulating the absurd. The lovers who lost their chance at heaven. I could feel their presence in every word. Like that Detroit burnout who flipped the bird within Christina's head. That writer's island of heaven the ghost of a romance lingering unspurred, making itself known by haunting each word upon the checkerboard floor betwixt your heaven. I could feel your presence in every word, clinging like death after the voice of a life unheard. Storyteller telling stories of others' secret heavens, the ghost of a romance lingering unspurred. After life in the aftermath of English from poets undeterred, from retelling stories of their fall from heaven, I could feel your presence in every word, the ghost of a romance lingering unspurred. Well, really interesting Villanelle. Thanks so much for sharing that, Zachary. That was uh, Adult Night, or uh, a Villanelle for Christina author of Adult Night at Skate World. And I, I know she watches the show, she'll probably catch that too. Um, and a great reminder too, that um, um, that you don't have to share, and I, I keep, should say this, but I keep forgetting. If you have a, if you don't finish the prompt in the time of a one week, you can share an older prompt too, poem. It's just anything that's been in the prompt lines. Um, you know, the new poem, hopefully too. But, uh, but older poems are great too. If you didn't f- quite finish one from last week and want to, f- Pub, or you know, one's published later, and you want to share that. Anything you want that's been in the prompt line series is part for the prompt lines. So thanks for sharing that. You have another small one too. I do. Do I have time? Or um, yeah, I mean, it's only a little. It's less than a full. Uh, yeah, why don't okay, you just so read that? Is, Go ahead. So is this, is this, my, for, my this week's prompt? prompt? Yes, it is. This okay. is this week's prompt. Okay. This is called Mama Sita. I was trapped in the wrong time like an old soul trying to evade a young body. I notice a young lady wearing the loudest skirt that I have ever seen, and she's broaching the invisible line between us. The fabric of her megaphone is a maze of floating lines that wrap around her over and over again, tightly clobbered by a crowd of leopard print spots announcing her arrival. She leans against my desk suggestively, back turned to me, saying everything by saying nothing. She had creeped up to me, pretend casually, as if she was trying to make her rehearsal look seemingly every day. But I saw her coming a mile away. 
She lets me know her thoughts by her language, but my eyes reply, they say, yes, I'm well aware of you. Interesting. Mamacita. More uh, more horror poetry from Zachary Hanika. Thanks so much for sharing that, Zachary. It's always fun having that, uh, that, that different type of poetry coming in. Yeah, thank you guys so much. See you guys next week. Yep, take care. Bye. That was two by Zachary Honeycutt. And uh, let's go to uh, Sharon Ferrante next. Hi, Tim. Hey, Sharon. Yeah, great to see you. Um, I love the interview. Did I unmute my? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I love the interview with Remus. Thank you both for that. Yeah, it's so interesting to, uh, you know, a culture I, I knew very little about and then getting to hear, you know, I read the whole book by one of the most prominent poets in, in Lithuanian history. It was fascinating for me personally. Yeah, he was interesting. And I love the poems. Yeah, I I love German. I love the German language. Mm -hmm. And I just wish I could like write a whole one or translate one. But no, it's not happening. <laughs> Yeah. And I did write one poem one time with just the title in German. Mm -hmm. So I do love that. It was really interesting. Thank you both for that. Yeah. Well, I'm always jealous of, of anybody who can you know speak multiple languages, let alone translate. And I, I wish that, you know, that's something I could do. It's never, never my strong suit. <laughs> so. Yes. And um, I got to listen to Dick read his poem yesterday on Poetry Superhighway to all. Oh, it was so good. Oh, that's great. Yeah, yeah. Poetry <laughs> Superhighway with uh, with Rick Lupert, who is a guest on the Rattlecast, yeah, too. Watched, yeah, I saw them chatting, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to watch what, Rick, uh, what Dick is going to read his poem, you know? Mm -hmm. So I got to listen to him read it twice. That wow. was another... Yeah. So I did a hyphen. Mm -hmm. I've only done a few, so just sit, bear with me. Well, it's great. I mean, you do so great with the haiku. It, it's good to have some other variety in the forms. I'm looking forward to hearing it. it, it yeah. It, it, well, they're, they're not easy for me. The first time I, well, I've only written like three, maybe. Last time I asked Nate to help me with the, li the line length and the punctuation. Because <laughs> I don't write like that anymore. Mm -hmm. And the title I'm not happy with, but I'll share. Okay. The total comes to... The man behind me with wet brown eyes and disheveled hair. He's on the phone with another who worries. He'll have to ditch the cheese. And his cane with a tap, tap, tap touches my ankles. There's always someone with a cane in this aching world. Eating one piece of cheese, slow. So I whisper to the cashier to add a $50 gift card to my order and give it to him. And off I went with my cheese. Now, every time I eat a piece of cheese, I think of him and feel the tap, tap, tap of his cane touching my ankles. Checking out craters on the moon, a hungry man. Oh, that was just wonderful. I love that, Sharon. I, I love, too, that line, uh, there's always someone with a cane in this aching world, eating one piece of cheese slow. That is great, and great haiku, too. Really wonderful. I so thank you. It was great to write it. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Always great to see you. Thank you. Yeah, it was Sharon Ferrante with uh, The Total Comes Too. Um, next, let's go to uh, Carolyn Cobb. Hello. Hi, Carolyn. Good to see you today. Good to see you too, and everybody else. <laughs> um, speaking of languages, my my um, poem is the title is in French. Ah, well, perfect. <laughs> Enchanté. And what and, does that uh, mean in French? I'm so bad. I can't. I mean, this comes from. Well, it. The way I learned it is um, my husband is Spanish. When I first met him, we spoke. English because I at that point I didn't really speak much Spanish but at the end of the conversation he said encantada huh. and I kind of sounded nice but it didn't dawn on me till a little later that that means enchanted mm -hmm. and I thought well, that's a nice thing to say then I found out that that's actually 
when we say pleased to meet you in Spanish, they most often say encantada. Oh, that's and interesting. It's enchanté. Oh, so I didn't know that. Yeah, that's great. That's where the title came from. So this is something that happened just this past week. Enchanté. I was sitting next to her. She seemed to look at me in a curious way. So I smiled at her. She smiled back joyfully. We smiled and almost laughed together. She reached out her hands towards me. I reached out one hand to her. Her little fingers encircled one of mine. She was six months old. I was enchanted. Oh, what a sweet poem. Enchante. Thanks so much for sharing that, Carolyn. <laughs> Right, take care. Okay, that was Carolyn Codd with Enchante. Um, next, let's go to uh, Nancy Tunnell. All right. Hello. Hey, Nancy. Great to see you. Oh, good to see you. I have loved every prompt this whole month. Oh, that's they great. have been so much fun to respond to. And mine, too, has a different language title. It's called Terra Beata. Oh. Ah. Latin. <laughs> mm -hmm. Terra Beata. Can you want to tell us what that means too for I think Terra is Earth. Earth. What is Blessed it? Earth. Blessed Earth. Ah, gotcha. Blessed okay. Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I always loved riding in grandpa's farm truck, trips to the feed store or to the tractor shop for parts. He sometimes passed other farmers coming from where we were going. Their greeting was always the same. One hand raised slowly into the air before gently returning it to the steering wheel. No furious waving like seven-year-old me grinning to reveal the gaps between my front teeth. Though I thought their ritual was odd, somehow I knew not to laugh. It was many years later before I realized their raised hands signaled what they share, their brotherhood as keepers of the soil, the necessity of perseverance, their unique vulnerabilities, the farmers, like priests of this blessed earth, always lift their hands to offer a mutual blessing. Oh, that's great. I can see that so vividly, the slowly raised hands. Thanks for sharing that. Have great you memory. seen people do that? <laughs> yeah, definitely. I have. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh -huh. Yeah, that was Nancy Snell with the Terra Beata. Um, next, let's go to Paul Mitchell Bernstein. Hey, Tim. Hey, Paul. Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, yeah. Yeah, that tractor thing, I've seen that. I've seen that so many times. And mm -hmm. also because usually the tractor's on the road and it's going so slow to begin with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it's, it's just thing, like a real slow casual. hand signal, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Well, this is, I was really excited about this prompt because uh, there's a story that I love telling and I've written a lot of versions of it. This is all brand new. I wrote a brand new condensed as I could. I have there's one version of this that I, is almost 16 or 17 full pages. This one is is three small pages, mm -hmm. uh, probably would be two uh, on normal size paper. But um, I tried to condense it down to... Uh, to the meat of it. And it's not really a poem. It's more of a, maybe a little flash nonfiction or something. Mm -hmm. which, uh, oh, well, call it a prose poem and then it's fine. <laughs> okay. It's a prose, <laughs> it's a prose poem. poem. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. It's called Stray. Okay. Uh, I would have grabbed a slice back on Duval Street, but I had to be at Emma's by 10. That was her one condition for letting me stash my gear at her place. Gear is what we called our backpacks and bedrolls on the road. And a safe place to leave them during the day was a huge relief from lugging them around all the time. Emma let me keep mine on the screened-in back porch of her place on Flagler Avenue. But I could only come by between 8 and 10. That was her one condition. By the time I passed the party on my way to Emma's house, I was wishing I'd grab something to eat back on Duval. I was starving and my stomach was kicking into a fit. I heard the boom and bass of the house music all the way back on Front Street long before I caught the smell of barbecue. When I reached the house, there were people all out in the front yard drinking. The lights from the backyard and the rising smoke 
from the grill lit the night sky above the house in a hazy glow that flashed off the flitting wings of hundreds of tiny insects swarming in the warm, swampy air. It was a big party, big enough to crash, I thought. I could probably grab a few beers and something to eat, maybe even a couch or some empty space on the floor where I could sleep. For sure, I thought. But first, I needed to get to Emma's and grab my gear. It was early in the evening, around 9.30. The walk to Emma's house and back would take about 45 minutes. I figured by then the party would be even bigger. 45 minutes to Emma's and back. I could do it in 30, I thought. And as I passed the driveway of the house, I could see down along the side of it to where the gate to the backyard was. There were Greek letters hung on it. It was a frat party. As a general rule, frat parties, frat boys for that matter, could be dangerous, but I was too hungry to worry about it. It'll be fine, I thought. I just have to be careful, cautious, on high alert like a stray dog sniffing around a campsite or some rednecks trash cans. But first I needed to get to Emma's house. Emma was a girl from London who I met busking on Duval Street one night when I first came to town. She was on holiday traveling around the States and had been in the Keys for longer than she'd planned. A couple months so far, she said. Sometimes she'd play flute out on Duval Street. Sometimes I'd play guitar along with her. She knew a lot of Beatles tunes. When I got to her house, she was out back on the porch with a couple friends listening to music and talking quietly. There were citronella torches burning along the path to the back of the house and white string lights strung up along the porch roof. Emma stood and introduced me and insisted I stay for a while and have some wine. So I did. But when she asked me to play my guitar, I took the opportunity to say I needed to get back. I thanked her, grabbed my gear, split. The house where the party had been was dark and quiet by the time I got back. There was no party. Been only over an hour. Cops must have come, I thought. Even inside, the place looked dark. But out in front, on the grass by the street, there were three big trash bags. I could see steam coming off one of them. I opened that one first, carefully unknotting the top, and pulling the plastic down, I saw three. I saw mounds of tin foil. I peeled some of it back to find a pile of chicken, breast, legs, thighs, and wings, still hot and nicely charred. I pushed that plate aside and tore back a bit of the next mound of foil. That one was hot dogs, already in buns, a proper pile, more than I could count. Under that were mounds of steam and foil I didn't even bother to check. Instead, I untied the next bag. It was full of unopened bags of buns and napkins and forks. At the bottom were still sealed bottles of ketchup and mustard and pickle relish and untouched tubs of potato and macaroni salad. The third bag was just full of trash. So I took the bag with the chicken and the hot dogs and carried it across the street, put it down on the curb and sat beside it, taking the plates of chicken and hot dogs out and laying them on the grass next to me. I was into my second piece of chicken when I heard a noise, something next to me rustling the foil. It was a dog. It looked rough, like a stray, skinny enough that I could see its backbone and ribs pushing through its matte black fur. It was standing over a piece of chicken it had taken off the pile. It froze when it realized I'd seen it, put its paw on the piece of chicken it had taken and stared at me, cautiously. I held out my food, offering to share, but it took a step back and put its eyes down towards the ground in that shameful, submissive way dogs do. So I went back to eating my chicken, ignoring the hung hungry stray. And after a few seconds, the dog did too, but slowly, cautiously watching me as it ate. I watched in my peripheral vision as it finished the chicken, bones and all, and slowly crept forward, keeping its eyes on me, and quickly grabbed the hot dog off the pile, then backed off again. It dropped the hot dog and stood on it like it had the chicken and watched me for a few seconds before putting its head down to take a bite. It ate slow, being careful to keep me in its vision. When I reached for another piece of chicken, the dog froze again and stared at me, half a hot dog hanging from its mouth. I nodded to it like I would to any stranger, to acknowledge it, say that I was friendly, and then went back to eating this time truly ignoring the hungry dog. 
When I looked again, the dog was lying down just on the other side of the plate, close enough that it could take hot dogs from the pile without standing up. It definitely showed a preference for the hot dogs. It looked at me for a moment, licking its lips, and I could see the mistrust had gone from its eyes. We ate together in silence. Unexpected bounty of food until the dog suddenly stood, stretched its legs and gazed up at me sleepily for a few seconds before it walked off slowly up the street. I watched it go until it seemed to just vanish all at once into the quiet darkness and was gone. I cleaned up, I put the bag of food back with the other bags across the street in front of the house where the party was. For the next stray to find, threw away the bones and a few half-eaten hot dogs and hoisted my heavy back by one strap up over my shoulder, grabbed my guitar and headed down towards South Beach to sleep for the night behind the wreck rack of rental kayaks. I lay there for a while, tracing the stars in the sky and listening to the gentle lap and sizzle of the waves watching up and down the beach. And then it was morning. Well, thanks so much for sharing that, Paul. I think it definitely a short story, uh, but a lot of poetry in the short story. Really beautifully put and, and great, great pacing, great storytelling there. Thanks for sharing it. Yeah, thank you, guys. Yeah. Yeah, there was uh, Paul Mitchell Bernstein with Stray. Um, next, let's go to Douglas Silver. Hi, uh, Tim, Katie, all the poets. Hello. Hey, Douglas. Yeah, great to see you. Good to see you. Thank you. I, too, want to say congratulations to Dick Westheimer for his piece and Poets Respond. I know he's not here, but uh, I always enjoy his work, so congrats to him. Yeah, thanks. Sure. If it's okay, Tim, I have two short pieces. written. They're both written on the same afternoon after taking a walk around my neighborhood. So Yeah, I yeah can, sure. Can, they're, they're short lines. I can yeah, read go ahead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The first one's called Another World. There's a world in the corner of this world full of dinosaurs, plastic and rubber, paint and glue, living among the ferns tall as palm trees and rock walls with caves big enough for the entire family. On my walks, I see them, these three loud little kids, often riding their high-tech bicycles like perfect mini motorcycles, always ready for another race or yelling at each other through their iPhones. But today, all three of them are there playing one pushing a brontosaurus across the tundra, another digging with his fingers, a new home between the rocks, and the third just sitting, watching, learning from the other two. They're silent now, these three loud little kids, and elsewhere. And don't look up at me as I'm passing slowly, quietly, noticing all this. And for just that moment, I am there, and then in another world with them. Hmm, really that's the first one yeah, Thanks. World. One, yeah yeah the same walk i was looking around for inspiration and i came up with this one and when i got home i wrote them down this one's called mothers she was raking the leaves on the median strip 80 maybe 90 he thought but still flexible enough to bend at the waist with straight legs reaching for another handful of soggy leaves just then another woman on the doorstep on the doorstep yelling for well, the mother of God, will you stop? He glances back at these two, mother and daughter maybe, grandmother and granddaughter more likely, neither of them looking toward him as he continues on his way, contemplating God's mother. Oh, really interesting turn in that one too. That was Mothers and then uh, Also Another World. By, uh, Douglas yes, thank you too. Yeah, thanks for sharing those. It's great to turn a walk into two poems. That's really wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Good ratio. Thanks a lot. Good to see you. Yep, you too. Thanks. Uh, Douglas Silver with uh, Another World. Uh, next, let's go to Rose Lennard. <clears throat> hey. Hi, Rose. Yeah. Uh, great to see is this your first time be being on here? I know the name very well. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. good to see you. So yeah. I'm, I'm in England, so it's... Um, you know, usually it's the middle of the night, so oh, I can't that's, join yeah. you. Yeah, so. well, I'm so glad you could make it on this special time, and hopefully we have more uh, more earlier shows uh, coming up too. So looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, well, that'd be great. <laughs> okay, so um, mine sort of um, it's written as a persona poem, mm -hmm. and it sort of slightly stretches the um, the definition of the stranger, um, but you'll see. Okay, yeah, let's hear it. it it's called witness. 
Oh, and it's it's um, harking back to the days of um, COVID lockdown. Mm. Some days in that lost year, he had to question whether he still existed. He knew about trees falling in the forest unnoticed and thought perhaps unwitnessed by the world, he too had lost his footing at some point or like a candle, his flame had guttered and gone out. The first time it came to his door, the cat ignored him, stared hard at a shrub, bent its head to wash its chest. He saw the pink tongue working at its task, how the tip of the ginger tail swayed to an inner heat, beat, sorry. He thought maybe he really was invisible. But the next day it came again and swiveled green narrow slotted eyes to look into his eyes held his gaze through the glass. And when he opened the door and stooping, held out his hand, the cat walked to him and with a hop, pushed its warm small head into his open palm. Ah, oh, that's a sweet ending to witness. Thanks so much for sharing that, Rose. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Yeah, great to see you. There's a Rose Lenard with witness. And um, next up... Let's go to, uh, it's Jenny. Is that Jenny Middleton, maybe? Hello? Hello? Oh, you have an echo, though. Hang on. Uh-oh. Um, why don't you, uh, let's see. Hmm. Are you there now? Can you hear me? Probably can you hear me? It sounds like a problem with Zoom, I think. Uh, maybe. Well, we'll try to go. I think, I think Jenny, what's probably happening? I don't think that's the case. So, um, so Katie, you're saying it may be logged in two places. I think the issue is probably like an external microphone and, and external speakers not canceling each other out, maybe. Because it's, it's such a quick thing. Let me see. Can you hear me, Jenny? Oh, and now she's on. Now you're on mute, so... Can you hear me now? Oh, it's just got an echo. Yeah, we can't. We have to try. Sorry, we'll just mute you again. Yeah. How do I? Yeah, I had, I had to put you on mute again, Jenny. But yeah, try, I think that the issue is there's like an external microphone. So if you probably have to plug in headphones. If you have headphones, that'll probably fix it. Um, okay. Oh, maybe, um, oh, there's two, Jen okay, let me, maybe that's the issue. We'll um, remove, there's two Jennies somehow. We'll remove one. Maybe that was it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, somehow, okay, that's, that solves the problem. Okay, so now we have Jenny Middleton. <laughs> hey, Jenny. Hi. <laughs> I'm, I'm really bad at technology. I think I said that the one other time I phoned him once. I, I try, I try with computers. But it's always battle. No, it's totally fine. So we figured out what happened. And it was uh, it was Katie Dozier who let us know that there were two Jennies uh, logged in. So yes. somehow you were logged in twice and had like two well, Zooms I, open, I guess, which is. I, I tried to log in and then I tried to email my phone. The hmm. email thing didn't work. And then it said something about trying to log in with a sound thing. And then I clicked that. And then all the I had a strange kind of bizarre uh, double kind of speak coming from the computer and I tried to log off that because obviously then I didn't even hear what anybody was saying it was like hearing like a sort of surrealist video or something <laughs> so I then t left that and yeah. then rejoined so it's yeah I had a kind of bizarre sort of <laughs> <beginning> <laughs> well it's point. okay don't worry about it it's great yeah. to finally see you I mean we have uh yeah. You know, we, we definitely recognize you from the comments all the time. It's great to have you on a time you can join from, from the UK. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, what, do um, you have, what do you have to share with us today? Oh, so I wrote a poem um, in response to the prompt about uh, uh, an encounter with uh, a silent encounter with a stranger. I have to say all of Katie's prompts are really um, interesting. They're, they always like provoke something and, you know, they're very accessible and, you know, that they're, they're um, ones that I think a lot of people enjoy writing for. I, I know that I do. So anyway, oh, this is the one that I wrote that I was going to share. I haven't been able to email it, so I don't think you'll be able to show it on the screen. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's called grapefruit and it's a high burn um so first part prose and then followed by haiku so okay yeah go um, ahead grapefruit i'm buying wine and a red grapefruit for the self scan scanners have died and the machine that prints labels for loose fruit and veg hasn't been programmed to recognize grapefruits he thinks i'm buying an onion I have to queue, I wait to be served by a man with dishevelled, silver-brown hair, stubble and tied eyes. He scans the wine through the laser, but then rolls the grapefruit to me and lopsidedly smiles. It's mine, for free, and I take it. Knowing I am complicit in a crime and tuck its round smoothness into the hessian bolt of my bag for life. Sweet orange, red with pomelo exchanging blushes well that's beautiful yeah thanks so much for sharing that jenny that was grapefruit by jenny middleton and just a wonderful hyphen and, and great to see you you know you've been on for so long in the, in the chat it's really nice to have you on the zoom yeah i, I listen in to critique it's really helpful actually i've learned lots from listening to it and and yeah i i don't i'm not good at speaking um to a camera but I kind of, I, I like the idea of sharing my poems and I, I end up I learn lots from listening to other poets on here. So anyway, great. I thought I'd... Yeah, well, I'm so glad you did. You did a great job. And, and your comments are always great too on the on the Facebook feed. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Take care. That was Jenny Milton with a Grapefruit. And uh, next, let's go to... Um, who's next in line? Uh... Hang on. Oh, Brian O'Sullivan is next. Hey, Brian. Oh, I, uh, I can't hear you, Brian. Uh, and you're not on mute. I think it might be your microphone. Well, we'll swing back. I don't know. For some reason, your, your mic's not working, even though you're not muted. We'll come back around. Uh, so let's go to Steve Harrell, then. Hi there. Hey, Steve. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm not really up to prompt poems most of the time. And uh, so fortunately, I was writing this poem when the prompt came up. So, uh. I, <laughs> so <laughs> well, I think it'll work. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> anyway, this poem's called uh, Demetrius Orlecki. Mm. Met him in Toronto, 1970, in a church basement. Deaf. Not for him, the sound of spring rain, robin's song, the loon's laughter, swish of a paddle, slap of a beaver tail, or even now the swaying groan of the Amtrak leaving Seattle. Not for him. He came to poetry readings to read lips, mine obscured by my beard. Never forgot him. Never forgot him as he walked away, my poems in his right hand. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that little story. Thanks for sharing that, Steve. And I have one request I would like to make to you, Tim. Yeah, sure. I, I would love to see maybe once a month or once every two months uh, an open mic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, that's not a bad without, idea. Without prompts, mm-hmm. because I always like to hear most people that read on an open mic I mean, they don't pick their worst poem to read, <laughs> you, you know, so I, I often appreciate it, the open mics. And I, to be honest, I miss them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, that's a good oh. idea. And I think maybe, you know, once a month open mic. And we also wanted to do, uh, is Katie still here? We want to do a kukai too. Maybe we'll start doing that. Yeah, she is. She's nodding her head. It'd be a lot of fun to do a haiku kind of open mic too. Yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> thanks, thanks for that suggestion. Okay. Anyway, thank you. I'm I'm going to get back to YouTube so I can read things. Great. Thanks so much. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was a uh, Steve Horrell with uh, Demetrius Orle- Orlecki. Um, and next, let's go to uh, Lisa Seidenberg. <clears throat> hey, Tim. Hey, Lisa. Yeah, good to see you. 
Thank you. I, uh, I'm actually, I, I, I hated prompts and now I really like them. I think it's really a good, <laughs> it I is think good. it's a good I mean, exercise. I, yeah. When I've been stuck and, you know, not knowing what to write about or anything, you just write to whatever and then magical weird things happen. It's really, really wonderful. Things come out of your head. You didn't know were there. <laughs> exactly. And that's almost the whole point <laughs> to get those things out. So it's fun having no direction. Right. Yeah. Um, and by the way, I really thought great interview with Remus. So that was what I thought that was just spectacular. Oh, thank you. Great, yeah. great interview. Great. He was so interesting. I think if, if <laughs> I'm not going to make another request, but I think I think it's great to have poets from other countries really, you know, ex expands our universe. Yeah, it's always fun when we get to have that. And yeah, yeah, definitely. So anyway, here's my poem. It's a bit lightweight following uh, Remus's poems, but um, okay called a boomer conspiracy the guy in the grocery store flashes me a knowing glance sizes up my boho hat and joan jet eyes as i assess his distressed moto jacket our proto-punk paint splattered cuff jeans just so downtown look i smile at the fellow boomer who tosses back a conspiratorial nod we bond like toddlers in preschool who spot other miniature creatures. We're aliens from another time of Blondie and Batman, Jane Fonda workout videos on VHS, no phones in your pocket, and everything costs so much less. No words exchanged or needed in our brief meeting. We felt the other's knowing glance, though fleeting, as tangible and real as the cash and coins we paid with at the checkout counter. Oh, very Thank you. nice. Yeah, I love I love all these little stories about um about <laughs> the boomer conspiracy is great. And and I just love Thank seeing you. these different interpretations of the prompts. That's what's so fun to me. Thanks for sharing that, Lisa. Thank you. That was uh, Lisa Seidenberg with the Boomer Conspiracy. Um next uh we have Rob Harris. Looks like from a car. Hopefully not moving. Hey Rob. <laughs> uh no, not moving. Hi. Uh can can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, we're good. How you uh, doing? I'm trying to figure out using it on a phone, and my battery's going to go dead soon, but hopefully I can get this in before it does. Well, we're um, glad we got you. Yeah, let's hear it. Thanks for having me on. Um, I, I enjoyed the interview, too, and uh, it was it's always good to hear um, what people's processes are, so I thank you for that. Yeah, thanks. Um, mine is called uh, Everyday Urban Ritual, and it's kind of a unique kind of format, but um, I didn't know what to do with it, so uh, this is what I got. Nice. That's um, good. It's... Uh, it goes like this. Uh, I was driving southbound on a foggy day in downtown Chicago when she darted out towards the painted yellow median in the middle of the block. I've been told that jaywalking is illegal, at least in theory, yet it's also a well-established practice in the city where I live. There was nobody else following behind me in the same lane, so I stopped the car and flashed a peace sign in her direction. She noticed this and smiled at me with a short wave while... She scampered across the rest of the street in front of my car. She kept on going toward her destination, and I did the same because an everyday urban ritual had once again served its purpose. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love the uh, I love the interjections there. Thanks so much for sharing that, Rob. And glad sure, the, thanks uh, for having me on. Yeah, I glad the phone it. lasted, too. It, it really looks nice, <laughs> and this sounds great. It's amazing it's, the technology we have these days. Agreed. Thanks again. Yep, take care. Here's uh, Rob Harris with Everyday Urban Ritual. Um, let's see. Next, we have Mary Keating. Hi. Hi, Mary. Yeah, great to see you, too. I thought I wasn't going to be for a while because I came in so late. <laughs> well, we're running up. I mean, we have a few people left, but yeah, uh, and I'm looking forward to hearing what you've got. What do you have for us? Well, I did. I did one, a really short one. I don't know if you got one. I did one called The Past is an Etched in Stone for the Silent Conversation. Mm hmm. Uh -huh. And then I did a short one called "This Tough Byron Poet." That's a a herethodon. Okay, let me. Uh, the one I have. Let's see. I have what it. Uh, oh, the past isn't always etched in stone. Yeah, because the the t document's a different title. But I got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then I did a, like a <clears throat> six line short one, but you don't have that one. Uh, I have. Let's see. Yeah, I have the past isn't always etched in stone, <laughs> and then I have aspiring poet. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the past is for the silent conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. The past is an Oz etched in stone. 
I stumbled across this grave only once before, my name crisply chiseled in gray granite above a lifespan carving out 40 years, a century before I entered this earth. And though I'd come to visit my mom, ask if she forgave me for not believing she resided six feet under, or that my voice carried through a ton of dirt, through the mahogany coffin, her brother and I agonized over choosing the day after she died, leaving us to imagine her final wishes. I found myself carrying on a silent conversation with a stranger just because we were namesakes. I asked her all kinds of questions about her life. How was to be a single like my mom before women could hold property in their name, hold a job even if it meant some man couldn't support his family. Asked her if she thought I might be her reincarnation. If it really mattered that she was buried under a Japanese maple. If she thought my mother appreciated that her lot had a panoramic view of the world beyond. If she might find me reprehensible, too, for not visiting my mom since she died 10 years past, spending my time instead with strangers. A gust planted a maroon leaf on my cheek. I blew my doppelganger an air kiss in return, strolled across five rows of headstones, up 50, and began the conversation I always meant to have. Oh, it was very interesting. It reminds me of a time uh, I got a random email from somebody. It was a Tim Green. He was like, I just wanted to talk to another Tim Green. So we had an <laughs> interesting conversation. Thanks for sharing. That was an interesting Yeah, comment. I came across, I did come across a, in a headstone with my name on it. It was kind of freaky. Yeah, that would. <laughs> um, okay, well, and, let's, uh, the other one is a short one, too. Do you want to read that, too? Yeah, it's a hair at the dot. I don't know if you know that form. It's a Welsh form. It's And I put the pattern below. Yeah, that's interesting. I not, I haven't heard that before. That's uh, and so it's uh. So this is the um, what do we call the uh, metaphor we had to do? Uh huh. Mm -hmm. The period in our life. Aspiring poet, I dreamt of cooking the finest meal, subtle flavors bursting with appeal beyond Michelin's four-star ideal. Reveled in how that fame would feel. Awake, fresh produce rotted in my fridge, while some minced sloth began to congeal. Hmm. Very interesting. That's an interesting <laughs> form too. The uh, the uh, yeah, here I thought, How do you say that? <laughs> I think you say it a here at the dot, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. Well, that's really neat. And uh, yeah, I like that form too. That's fun. Thanks for sharing that. It's a fun form. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And so everybody watching at home, I mean, it's it's too intricate to even describe really <laughs> the way those rhymes are hidden in there. That's really neat. Yeah. Thanks, Mary. That was uh, Mary Keating with an aspiring poet and then uh, her other poem as well. Um, okay, let's go next to, um, oh, Brian O'Sullivan was leaning forward. I think he might be ready. Let's see, Brian, are you there this time? Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can. It worked perfectly. So oh, whatever yeah, happened, yeah. that was the problem. <laughs> yeah, I had to apparently switch to a different microphone driver for some reason. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Yeah, no, well, I'm like, glad you're here. Yeah, it just occurred to me that I should have written a silent interaction prompt about not being able to use my microphone last week either on um, poetry space. It would have been <laughs> yeah, good. Been uh, I'm now. surprised no one did that. The uh, technical difficulties version of yeah. the prompt. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but um, I was having trouble thinking of a silent interaction, so I wrote about one that I wasn't alive for, but that I read about. Also a connection to the um, poetry space. Oh, and that's also, right. Yeah, I saw uh, this on the prompt. Yeah, uh, yeah. Katie told me about it. And I went the uh, Villanelle route again. Mm-hmm. Well, very oh, fine. Yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing this one. Okay. The driver stopped to watch. August 12th. I see the president almost every day as I happen to live where he passes to or from his lodgings out of town. I see very plainly Abraham Lincoln's dark brown face with the deep cut lines, the eyes, etc. Always to me with a deep latent sadness in the expression. We have got so that we always exchange bows and very cordial ones. Walt Whitman, Abraham Lincoln. Yeah, and I should say, just interject that I didn't know this until we did that poetry space on, on Whitman, uh -huh. that he was obsessed with Abraham Lincoln, which I did uh -huh. not know and, and sort of found him intriguing and sort of, I don't know. <laughs> and, and as far as I know, they never actually spoke. So, you know, I guess they were nodding acquaintances, but I decided to still count them as strangers. Um, yeah. <laughs> at least from Abraham Lincoln's point of view, he might have just wondered who was this weird guy with the beard who was nodding at yeah, him. Yeah, probably. Sure. Yeah, really interesting. So, good old Abe and Uncle Walt exchange their cordial bows, and we all bring our business to a halt. Oh, the title, I'm sorry, is The Driver Stopped to Watch. 
good old Abe and Uncle Walt exchange their cordial bows and we all bring our business to a halt, whether stopping at the Star Saloon for a multi ale or answering some urgent call. Good old Abe and Uncle Walt, meeting on the heaven's vault, make such a sight that we, enthralled, bring all business to a halt, to watch as our friend, looking like an old salt, and our epic president, deep-lined and tall, good old Abe and Uncle Walt, meet while armies still assault each other. We dream that even the arsenal brings its business to a moment's halt. We pay a heap of golf stamp coins to linger here before the pall drops when good old Abe and Uncle Walt bring their business to a halt. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I love the, the rhymes and the use of the, the form there. The drivers stop to watch. Yeah, very fun. There's a tiny one I see, too. <laughs> you that one? Yeah. Yeah, sure. It's very small. Oh, yeah, it is small. All right, hold on. Okay, entitled. Stolen from William Carlos Williams. Williams, excuse me, for the typo. This is just to say I have eaten the snickerdoodles from this plate which you made and which I'd so urgently asked for. Give me more. <laughs> Yeah, that's very fun. Thanks for sharing both those, Brian. Yeah, both Thanks. of them are a lot of fun. Yeah, take care. Shit. Yeah, that was two from Brian O'Sullivan, uh, including a fun uh, spinoff on the uh, <laughs> on the plums. Okay, um, Bishwajit Mishra is next. Hey, Biz. Hi, Tim. Yeah, good to see you. How you doing? I'm good, thanks. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, before I start, you talked about the plagiarism, mm -hmm. and I may have to confess something. Uh -oh. I wrote a haiku, and you know, it's one of those common lines that you use every day, but I, it, I, I gave it and submitted, then I realized, wait a minute, I have, I have seen that line. And it was from one of the ones you posted. <laughs> <laughs> well, it happens. I mean, the thing. Yeah, I, that's with... a very common line. It's like I pick. Mm -hmm. I pick someone. So it, it's so common, but I said, it's like picking the sun. And you had to use that exact line. I mean, I said, well, it's gone, it's gone. <laughs> well, it happens I, as long as, yeah, I, I think maybe the uh, the fair use type, um, you know, right criteria apply maybe to plagiarism too is if it's like expanding and doing things in a different direction one line i don't know i wouldn't worry it's about it it's a short <laughs> thing you get very you got few lines to play with yeah and exactly in that one which really mm -hmm. does the job and sometimes i mean i could there are a lot of repeated lines so it's just played this way how many times frog and ponds and <laughs> <laughs> All those things have in it, but I, I just thought, okay, if it comes out, I have to put it out and apologize to you. I might <laughs> well, that's okay. Don't worry about it. So, it. so what do you have to share here today, though? I, I have a prompt, prompt poem that I sent by email. Mm -hmm. uh, it's called Thank You. Yep, we got it right here. Okay. Thank you. On a wintry Sunday evening, a woman with two kids arrived at your shop that you were about to close for the day. You had answered the CAA text call and asked him to bring them in with a blown tire. They had to go far, farther than allowed with a donut, and other shops were closed, but you waited outside in the cold, and the first thing you did was ask them to go eat before the shops closed. They came back, and the car was ready, and you made her cry because you not only didn't, didn't charge her, you said she had paid more than she should by waiting in the cold with two hungry kids. I never got a chance to meet you, but I talk of you many times, but I fail always to thank you enough. And I need a name. My wife must have told me, but I'm bad with names. But I need a name because that's the world I know, the world of names without which how I can thank you and make my gratitude visible. So I want to give you a name. I even give the Almighty God's names for the prayers to come and hold. But I think again, this is not the same. This is after the fact. There is no expectation. There is no obligation. So why limit you? So I just let my thanks float to you in the air. All this I do in the silence between two breaths so that my gratitude stays whole. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Another sweet poem. It's been a bunch of sweet poems today. That's thank you, by uh, Bishop Jit Misher. And I, I love that idea. It's a it's kindness week too, apparently, in all the schools in the United States, because at least the ones here. And um, nice nice kindness poems too as well. Thanks for sharing that, Bishop Jit. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Take care. Ten. Goodbye. Yeah. Bye. There's a uh, Bishop Jit Misher with thank you, and uh, Susan Talley is up next. Oh, you're still muted. Oh, there you go. Hello, everyone. Hi, Susie. Yeah, great to what see you. Those, all these poems, I could really visualize it from a specific, um, a place that's known by the writer. I forget what it's called, mm -hmm. but you, so many stories, you know, I could see them. And that one about going through the trash, I followed that right along. I mean, it, it was prose, but I was right there. Yeah, it was and so vivid. Yeah, from Paul Mitchell Bernstein. Setting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So what do you have to share? I also want to say one thing. Oh, yeah. Do we believe that dreams are encounters? Because that's a wide <laughs> range of encounters. I don't know. I think if you believe that, then definitely. I do. Definitely for sure. Yeah. And uh, yeah. Okay. Henna Secrets. I shouldn't have read the title. <laughs> a secret society in a flurry of purple silk whispers by. They don't see me apply their henna like herbal mud from the Nile. Eavesdropping only brings the jangled sound of cere ceremonial bangles. I cannot see the rest. Oh, I can't see the rest, but... Okay, I'll read the rest. Um, on bathroom tiles, bits of ancient language fall like hieroglyphics to vanish like amethyst smoke of my motivation. Those women know, knew nothing. Yeah, beautiful, uh, beautiful poem there. I love the, the music in that, Susan. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that. Okay, yeah, that was Susan Talley with a henna secrets. Um, and let's see, is that it for the... Uh... Open lines, yeah. So I think uh, Carla Schwartz uh, didn't realize that the show was um, earlier than normal and, and has an appointment right now. So asked if I would read this hyben for her, and of course I'd be happy to. Um, here we go. This was Carla Schwartz's uh, prompt poem. <clears throat> Let me get it all on the screen. And uh, there we go. So this is uh, "No Secrets in the Snow." Each loop I ski, I track my tracks. I use up a little more snow as the afternoon sun burns in, even in January. Each loop, each ski step, each glide by, I spy the footprints alongside my trail, their compression, the snow's concentration, the drilling down of snow's potential, their drilling down to bare ground. So to my trail crusher, my trail crasher, I say to you, seething in my mind, I say to you, why? First a statement, then a question, then demand. We have so few days cold enough to keep, cold enough not to wear the snow out, not to unveil the pine needles, the mud. How would you feel if your passions were trammeled, if something precious to you were trampled by a stranger? What is it about please stay off the ski trail? What is it about please go around the other way when there's snow that you don't understand? What is it about my prayers to hold my trail, my grooves, my lanes intact against the lingering of sun and rain these January days, these lengthening days that impels you to deny me? In snow, a man's foot print media. How oh, very interesting. That's great, Hyben. It, it's something I've, um, it's funny, I live in a ski resort town here on a right wood, but I don't ski. It's a little too dangerous for me. I don't want to break, break my bones. And you can see the ambulance is driving by all the time. I think maybe, um, I don't know if Carla does the downhill or the cross country variety, but I do know very well. Um, and then here the, the culprit is the dog. Um, but we make these like nice, ski, like sledding runs with the kids and then the dog would run all over and ruin them. And it's the same kind of thing. So stay, keep, keep off that dog and <laughs> keep off those ski tracks. Thanks for sharing that Carla. Really fun. Find Hyben there. Um, we have another one too. Um, oh, Ted Govera has one. And also Nicole Christine. Let's see. So this is our stranger poem. Um, I'm sorry I've missed the last couple weeks. My energy's been low. I'm hopeful to make it through the entire night this week with prep lines. Uh, well, I think um, 
Nicole might not realize that it's an early show, but let, let's read this poem for her. This is a stranger poem. Um, the, the title of the file is he decided to go for a walk one day. So maybe that's the title. That's the first line too, though. Here we go. He decided to go for a walk one day. He took his umbrella to defeat the rain. He grabbed his rain boots, finished his morning routine. She decided to go for a walk one day. She grabbed her raincoat, her sunglasses on, in her phone. The river looked so beautiful. She decided to go alone. He took his last sip of coffee, opened the door to breathe in the air, wanting to answer life's questions. Why does everything seem so unfair? She thought how nicely it would be to walk along the bridge. She came across him about halfway through. His eyes were shaped like almonds. His umbrella got away from him, and she caught it with a whim, holding tight onto her yellow notebook. Sorry, miss, he said, clutching his mug with his hand. Oh, that's all right, she replied. Haven't I seen you before, she asked. Maybe I'm terrible at losing things. I don't mean to be a bore, she, he replied. Oh, you're fine, she said, with all her might. As they want, went their separate ways, she wrote in her notebook with her hands, sometimes the things we lose are meant to be found in someone else's shoes. Ah, Someone Else's Shoes by Eva Christine. Thanks so much for sharing that, Eva. Um, and then... Uh, here is Ted Guevara's poem. He's got a photograph as he usually does. This is a uh, Renaissance type painting, but with um, uh, Superman holding like some kind of maiden <laughs> um, as he flies up in the air with a red kind of cape surrounding them. So anyway, that's an interesting photograph uh, by, or f courtesy of Ted. And the poem here is this, the long and short of it. Here we don't fly till you're home. For in our hands we fold carefully our cat capes. We don't know if they wrinkle due to honey or dye or just water. If it's honey, we can live with a slowness. If it's dye, we can stain even our fingers. If it's water, our reflex to put in our mouths eludes the thought of it being bitter till you come back home. It's a very interesting poem there. Uh, the Long and Short of It by Ted Byrne Wilvera. Thanks for sharing that, Ted. And I do believe... That's going to wrap up the prompt lines for this week. Uh, oh, no, Dick Westheimer, too. Let's do share Dick Westheimer's because he's not here, but he was here earlier. Um, we'll do, so we'll do one more poem. This is a near checkout at the largest supermarket in the world. That's interesting. I wonder where that is. Uh, I guess in Ohio, maybe. <laughs> here we go. Uh, near checkout at the largest supermarket in the world. He was in the candy department, too. The man in the motorized wheelchair. His beard was grayer than mine, and he had better hair. I was looking for good and plenty, my dime store crave, in the labyrinth of gumballs and jelly bellies and bazooka bubble and blow pops. What he was looking for, I'm not sure, but when our eyes scanned the aisle like phasers trying to lock on target, met, his look said we weren't going to find what we were looking for, at least not here. An older woman trailed slightly behind him, and, set, and that look I got from her wheelchair guy said, I just want to get away for a minute. Be that boy who could eat jawbreakers without cracking a tooth. Maybe pocket a pack of Charleston Chew as my buddy Donnie knocks something off a shelf to distract Mr. Chaim, Chimes at the five and dime. I'd share with Donnie as we ran down to the river to sit, to skip stones and skinny dip. My look back didn't carry any fine story like that. I just crave that black licorice and pink sugar tint on my tongue to not tell anyone the silly thing I'd done. I think great. I love that last that last uh, verse, too. Thanks for sharing that. That was Dick Westheimer's near checkout at the largest supermarket in the world. And that is going to wrap up the uh, prompt lines for tonight. Thanks, everybody, for sharing poems. Katie Dozier is still here, which means uh, Charlotte's probably still sleeping. Hey, Katie, how you doing? <laughs> she is asleep. It is accurate. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's very convenient that she stayed asleep for the entire prompt lines. That was very convenient. I appreciate <laughs> I'm sure that's exactly why, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. She was just very considerate. And nothing to do with the bad night's sleep she got last night. <laughs> no, <Nope>, nothing <laughs> to do with that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, well, since you're still here, do you want to reveal next week's prompt? Do you have it written down? <laughs> I did, actually, and I pulled it up on my screen. Aren't you so proud of me? I'm very proud. So, <laughs> this week's prompt is going... Oh, we should also say that the month is ending, so you should submit your poems before the end of the month. Yep, and this week is going to be... It's going to be February next week, right. which means this is actually a February prompt. Right. So do you don't have to rush to get it in by this February 1st. doesn't even matter. 
It's not even going to be listed on the website yeah. until after you finish reading all the submissions right. a few days into February. Um, right. But uh, but this will be the February, the first February prompt. So uh, It will be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just wait for it to be an option on that drop down menu and you can submit it when just you Just be patient. Want. You have 29 days to submit. Yeah, <laughs> you do. Yep. There you go. There okay. is time. Okay. So the prompt is going to be to write a poem entitled A Brief History of X, where X is a word that needs to be translated. And then the poem is less than a page, because I feel like if it's called A Brief History of something, it shouldn't be more than a page, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, so uh, yeah, so then and that's written after The Brief History of, uh, of Vilnia, one of the poems mm -hmm. we heard today from uh, Remus Uzgaris. Mm -hmm. And then also, of course, speaking to his translation, or at least a nod to his translation skills that I'll be envious of forever. Yeah, for sure. A nod to, to translating without having to actually know the language, which is nice. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. I do. Yeah. I so wish I could, you know, knew any language well enough to translate, but oh, well. <laughs> at least you have English kind of down. So that, there's that. That's true. Kind of. Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thanks so much. Kate. Glad you could stick around and uh, looking forward to... Uh, the, the poetry space, too, on Thursday, talking about plagiarism. A lot of fun. Thanks for being the prompt poetry editor, of course. Well, thanks for having me as the prompt series editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, thanks, Katie. Bye. Bye. Yeah, it's Katie Dozier, our uh, prompt series editor. And now it's time for the Saiku. And the Saiku for this week was based on this article from the University of Princeton. Um, here we go. Let me see. Again, it's always hard to get the new get them to fit on the screen. Here we go. So this is this thing. This is the uh, prompt, the story for this week. And it is this. Um, cellular scaffolding rewired to make microscopic railways. Isn't that fun? So um, there are these little microtubules that sort of, it's sort of like scaffolding within a cell. And these folks at Princeton University found a way to engineer that scaffolding and then use it like a little rail system to deliver like chemicals throughout the cell. It's an amazing little bit of nanotechnology. Think of that like um, just in that biomolecular level and to be having, you know, a, a rail system that you build um, is, is pretty amazing. And that's what the research did there. You can see some pictures of it, um, which looks kind of like it reminds me of those sparkler things that are... Um, what are those things? It's like um, you can sort of flash them around like hair, you know, and then they light up. What are those things called? I don't know. It's kind of like an alternative to fireworks on the 4th of July. I can't remember. It's a, it's a, it, but that's what they look like. It's really fun. So anyway, that is, the, uh, that is the story I was reading this week. And then here is the haiku that was inspired by that. Uh, here we go. Thunder through the canyon train tracks. That should be thunder through the canyon train tracks that's your haiku for this week your saiku and that's the show for this week thanks everybody for uh, sharing poems and for enjoying us at this earlier hour it's a lot of fun i have the whole day ahead of me now which is interesting too um but thanks to everybody who shared poems and the guest remus uzgaris a uh, really fun episode next week's guest in the rattle cast is going to be george david clark yeah, he, his second book just came out, Newly Not Eternal. He's a wonderful formal-leaning uh, type poet. Um, there's a really interesting um, sort of a variation on A Crown of Sonnets as part of the sequence here. Um, it's a wonderful book by George David Clark. He's also the editor of 32 Poems, which is one of my favorite print magazines as far as poetry goes. So it'll be fun talking to him about poetry, 32 Poems, his new book, all of that. Coming up, Rattlecast number 231, the actual regular time. I was wrong last week. I forgot about the, the moving up. But this week, it is actually true. I can confirm. Regular time, Monday, February 5th, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great week in the meantime, and I'll talk to you later. Good day.